Hello, Fiorella Nash. This is Alex Clark recording with uh, the Generation Vatican II podcast. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'd like to, I'll start off with uh, your bio. Mm -hmm. Fiorella Nash is an Anglo Maltese writer and broadcaster living in the UK with her husband, four children, and a dog called Montgomery. Her research focuses on life issues from a pro life feminist perspective. Fiorella has delivered lectures and papers at conferences all over the world on subjects including abortion, euthanasia, assisted reproductive technology, ART, surrogacy, and population control. Her book, The Abolition of Woman, was described by former cosmopolitan journalist Sue Ellen Browder as, quote, a daring revelation of the shocking exploitation of women around the world. Fiorella has appeared on radio and TV programs such as ITN 24-Hour News, the BBC's Women's Hour, and Premier Radio's Woman to Woman. Fiorella, thank you for joining us today. It's lovely to talk, all the way from England. Yeah. Uh, so first off, you have uh, a degree in bioethics, yes? No, I actually have a degree in English literature. In English because, literature? Yeah, because it often comes as a surprise to people. But when I was a student, it was almost impossible to study bioethics as a, de as a degree. It's quite a recent subject, particularly here in the UK. I think it started mm -hmm. a bit earlier in the States. So most of us who now work in bioethics actually have degrees in different subjects. Um, okay. But of course, you know, if you study a humanities degree, you learn research skills, you learn analysis and all the skills I learned studying English, I then almost immediately transferred to bioethics. And I've spent the last 15 years researching bioethics. Gotcha. So uh, in, in America, we have this idea that like, hey, go to college, study English and learn how to think. Uh, yes, is that sort of exactly. much more prevalent than in the UK? Yes, that's very much the idea. I mean, you now have, um, you do now have bioethics degrees available in the newer universities, um, particularly at graduate level. Um, but in the past, yes, it was much more part of maybe divinity or philosophy. But it's, I, th I still think there's still a sense of, yes, you study a subject that's interesting to you. But yes, you learn how to think, you learn how to analyze, how to read, to read data, you know. Gotcha, gotcha. So uh, as you were studying uh, uh, throughout college, what what were some of your favorite classes and what were some of the things that you would do to, to link the humanities with bioethics then? Well, the, the Cambridge English degree is quite, um, I wouldn't say conservative, but it's very, um, you know, I, I don't think it's changed a great deal in the last 50, 60 years. You know, you, you study English literature, you start in 1300 and you work your way through and you do, you study tragedy, you study Shakespeare, you know. Um, but you also get the chance to study um, modern literature in the third year. And um, I studied a lot of modern literature in my, my last year because I wanted to be part of the conversation. I wanted to be part of the contemporary conversation. And I studied... Um, the, I studied the Catholic martyrs, for example, the literature of one of the Catholic martyrs um, as a, a graduate, because all the way through my time at university, I was very interested in the whole social justice scene. Um, and I came to the pro-life movement through a slightly circuitous route as a student, rather uh, rather an unusual journey compared with many of my contemporaries. And so that, that interest in the sanctity of life and the value of the dignity of the human person just encroached further and further on my, mm -hmm. my studies. And it was a natural progression for me then to go into, into that whole field later. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, when you say the Catholic martyrs, um, which specific ones are you referencing? Um, well, I did my thesis on um, St. Robert Southall or St. Robert Southwell, depending on... Uh, I'm not familiar. Uh, oh. Could you give a, a brief, a brief explanation? Oh, absolutely. I love Robert Southall. I'm delighted mm -hmm. to do that. Um, he's, um, I think he's a bit of a, a, a well-kept secret, really, in English literature. He is regarded as having been the first metaphysical poet in the English language. He had quite a big influence on John Donne and even Shakespeare. Um, there are little threads of his, his epic poem, St. Peter's Complaint, in poems of, of Shakespeare, like The Rape of Lucrece, for example, um, and um, so, some, of, some of his later works. So 
he was quite influential in, in his own time. Um, he was a Jesuit, so he was one of the Jesuits who came over to England on the mission, and he was martyred, he was tortured and martyred when he was only 33, so he, he died quite young. But he, um, his English verse at the time was so popular that the Protestant Bishop of London gave the imprimatur for it to be published, because, of course, at the time with censorship, um, because he didn't realise that Robert Southerl was a Catholic. Oh, wow. Uh, and he, he, he so loved his poetry, and loved the Christian messages that he permitted it to be published. Um, wow. And it went through, um, his poetry went through more editions than Shakespeare in his day. So he, he then sort of slipped into um, obscurity, as happened to quite a lot of those poets at the time. But I was fascinated by him because he was both a, a very gifted poet, but he was also a priest and and then ultimately a martyr. And you, you can see all the, um, you see his anxieties and his hopes for the future of England written into his writing. Mm -hmm. uh, forgive my ignorance. I, so uh, Britain with, uh, with Anglicanism, it did have a period of uh, consternation with Catholicism. Um, is that sort of the timeline where uh, where this particular martyr was was operating, and that's why it was sort of like a to use a tired term, a, like a faux pas that he wasn't censured, even though he was a Catholic. Is or is this oh, much yes. later? Okay, okay. Oh no, no, because he, he was an Elizabethan poet, so it was at the height of the persecution of Catholics. Oh wow! Um, and you know, and he was he eventually went the way of many Catholic priests of um, being being hanged, drawn and quartered in, in, at Tyburn. Um, so it, it's extraordinary, in fact, that um, that he was he was sort of ecumenical in the old fashioned sense of the word, that so many people were moved by his message. And in fact, when he was executed, a huge crowd gathered and he died a, a rather quicker death than most of them did because they um, they mounted the platform and pulled on his body so that he'd die quickly. It was a, it was a mercy that was sometimes granted to people when they were hanged, drawn, and quartered. If they, if they, um, if they had the the the, um, the sympathy of the crowd, that they would actually oh, mount up and they they pull they pull down on the body as as they were hanging, so that they'd um, they would die okay. quickly. They die quickly, so that by the time they were being sliced up, they were already dead. And he in fact had such. Um, he had such a big sort of fan base without knowing it that they all came to his execution. So he, um, it, it was, uh, it was interesting. I mean, it, it seems like an odd way to show your appreciation of a poet, but, yeah. um, but it did mean, you know, yeah. he, he didn't suffer in quite the way that some of them did. That is incredible. And I didn't, I didn't know this kind of strange, uh, like audience participation when it comes to, <laughs> Like wow, hey, we like this guy. Let's let's yeah. get this over quickly. We don't want to see this. He's he's yeah. a nice dude. Wow, that is incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I understand your attraction to his story then, and why uh, why he would play such a pivotal role in your life. That's that's really fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so uh, if we could return back to yeah. bioethics, then um, you uh, in in your book specifically. So you you've written a book, uh, the abolition of woman which is yeah. a fantastic title. I love it. Thank you have said elsewhere that it was a reference to C.S. Lewis's The Abolition of Man. Mm -hmm. So uh, Abolition of Man was a defense of objective value and natural law. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how your book title then used that reference to sort of uh, continue or build upon or uh, 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 diverge from C.S. Lewis's message? Mm -hmm. Well, in many ways, I, I think there's quite a connection between my message, if you like, and C.S. Lewis is though, um, what I was really thinking in terms of, I mean, yes, I'm a, I've been, I'm a big fan of C.S. Lewis. I've been very influenced by C.S. Lewis's, uh, his, his apologetics particularly. Um, but I was sort of very aware that with so much of the rhetoric that's being thrown about, about womanhood and radical feminism and the way in which the suffering of women is being manipulated and I talk specifically about abortion as a weapon to manipulate women in the book, but I also talk about a lot of other ways in which I feel women are still being manipulated by the very people who claim to speak for them, that we are, as it were, in danger of the abolition of woman. We are losing any sense of what it means to be female and mm -hmm. of a genuine female experience. So that was what I was hoping to build on, just to try and restart that conversation. 
Yeah. Oh, that's uh, well, I think it's in your introduction. Um, you sort of yeah. outline exactly how how you're hoping to uh, use your book here. Uh, there's this great quote um, from you. In the pages that follow, I do not wish to simply argue that pro-life feminism is something other than a contradiction in terms, but rather that pro-life feminism should be a powerful movement in the forefront of the battle to defend the youngest and most vulnerable human lives. The alternative is the abolition of women. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fiorella, you are a fantastic writer. That is, that is wonderful. Uh, I see how you're trying to build off of N.C.S. Lewis. Uh, with his literary style and uh, his subject matter and really push into um, feminist issues. And I, I, I love how that those two sentences are really uh, laying out, hey, this is the course of the book. Pro-life feminism, not a contradiction in terms. This is where we should be going. That's really, yeah. and I love your writing style. I love your Thank writing you. style. <laughs> um, however, uh, you only talk about in this little uh, intro, you talk, mm -hmm. it, it, you very much allude towards abortion. Yeah. Uh, this could give the impression that, hey, by pro-life feminism, you simply mean uh, a single issue, an anti-abortion stance, quote unquote, an anti-abortion feminist, not really pro-life feminist. Uh, could you nuance out the difference there? Well, I think there is a difference because um, even though I feel abortion is very central to the, well, to the to the problems that women are facing, um, certainly um, within feminism, and um, you know, I, I do go into a lot of details about that in the book. There are a lot of other issues connected up with that, which I feel are not being adequately addressed by society, including, for example, commercial surrogacy. Um, related issues, I mean, issues related to abortion, like sex selective abortion, enforced population control, all sorts of areas connected up with women's fertility, but also women's status within society. So I don't think it's enough just to talk about abortion, because I think even though abortion is a very major weapon used against women, it is, um, it's only one. And there are, and it's also, it has spawned so many other forms of exploitation of women. I do think, for example, there is quite a strong connection between abortion and commercial surrogacy because they both seek to use the women's bo woman's body, but in different ways. So um, I think it all comes down in the end to a misplaced understanding of women and what will truly liberate women. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so in uh, regarding surrogacy, in chapter four, outsourcing reproduction, you have this. Like abortion, ART is presented as protecting women from the dictates of their own bodies and providing them with the necessary tool in the battle for their empowerment. Uh, you, that's, that's exactly what you're getting at here, where uh, reproductive rights are being sold as an opportunity for the woman to control their own lives, however you argue differently. Mm. Well, I think for a start, um we're not really talking about the control of one's own life. We're talking about the control of many others. Um, and I do talk a lot later in the book about the supposed clash of rights, the right to bodily integrity versus the right to life and how we can perhaps come to some kind of a consensus there. But when it comes to commercial surrogacy, it involves ex ex an expectation that an awful lot of other people will be hurt, will have their own rights curtailed, or their own lives ended potentially for the sake of somebody having a baby, a much wanted baby. It involves the biological enslavement of another woman to produce the much desired baby. Sometimes it involves more than one. It can involve the the woman who actually bears the baby, it can involve the egg donor, it can involve um, a sperm donor. There can be multiple people, multiple agencies involved in that. So we have to stop looking at children and childbearing as a right in itself, because we cannot ask other people to harm themselves or to sell themselves into a form of slavery to give us what we want. You know, there is so much more to the mother-baby relationship than that. I would like to say before 
taking it any further, I have huge sympathy for women who cannot have children. I think infertility is one of the great crosses that women and couples are expected to carry largely alone. And I don't think we have as a society, and in some ways even as a church, really found the right ways to support women in that situation. Um, I know multiple couples who for all sorts of reasons have never been able to have children and I've become very aware of just how painful it is. And it's it's a pain that never goes away. You know, the the woman will not be having babies when her friends are having babies. Her children won't be graduating from college when her friends' children, are, that she'll never be a grandparent. I mean, there are, there are so many stages of life that are affected by that one loss, if you like, that, that, that one, um, you know, that one cross that they're, they're having to carry. So I do feel that couples like that need a lot of support and need to be able to look at alternatives like NAPRO technology, for example, or adoption, international adoption, for example, which I, I know a number of couples who've gone down that route. So I'm in no way saying to couples who can't have children, the fact that you can't have a child isn't important, because I know as a parent myself how important mm -hmm. children are. But in the end, nobody has a right to a child because once a human being becomes a right, their own rights become less important. We've had situations with commercial surrogacy, for example, of surrogate babies being being just dumped. I mean, there, there were a few cases in the, in the papers, you know, the, the Thai surrogate, you know, with the, the baby with Down syndrome, for example. Mm -hmm. And... It can happen. I mean, I cite a few examples in my book of a child who, for whatever reason, the, the commissioning parents don't collect them, who becomes stateless, homeless, parentless, with five potential parents and no parents. Um, we've had cases of uh, there's, there's a what's sometimes called a, a black a black market in babies in India, where excess surrogate babies are sold off into the criminal underworld, you know. There are, you know, you're talking about creating a situation in which an awful lot of human lives are wasted or are placed in very abusive or vulnerable situations. Did that come as a surprise? I did not know uh, that the, the quote unquote waste inherent in surrogacy children that are no longer wanted and then you have this question what do you what do you do with the child because it's still there mm. well what do you the, have yeah yeah, yeah and, and if the child has a defect like mm. i mean in america it's very vogue to just say oh your child has a defect like just get rid of it that's not don't put yourself through that yeah same in the same in the UK. Um, over, over well over ninety percent of babies with Down syndrome, for example, are aborted. Um, but the the really sad thing is with commercial surrogacy is quite often. Um, I'm talking about international surrogacy here, where yeah. couples go to developing countries. Um, very often, the the surrogate mother will not have the right to say no if she is told to have an abortion. You know, if a scan reveals there is something wrong with the baby, she will not have a right to say no. So where does the right to make choices come into it when the surrogate mother has to have an abortion because the commissioning couple don't want the baby? Um, I even came across cases in my studies where women could be given abortion pills without their knowledge and would then be told they'd had a miscarriage because they're given so many pills in these baby factories that they've no way of knowing what they're taking. Um, and... But what really did shock me, and it takes a lot to shock me because of the, the nature of the, the, the research I conduct, was there was a, a documentary um, that was screened around the time I was doing my work of uh, a, where a journalist went to India and she found that there was this whole black market of white babies. And what would happen is quite often these weren't even leftover babies. The surrogate mother would have, say, two or three embryos implanted into her womb. She would give birth to twins or triplets, but the commissioning parents would be told she'd had a, one baby. So they'd take the one baby home and the other two would be left. And it was quite a deliberate act in that case. Um, and then the, the babies would be sold. 
So there could be commissioning parents out there in America, in Britain, in other parts of Europe who don't even know that they have children out there somewhere, you know, and have no way of knowing. Now, these may be unusual situations. I'm sure there are, you know, clinics in India that would never do that. But how could you, how could you ever know? You'd always have that question mark in your mind. That's what, the first thing that came to mind when I saw that was that, that sense of unknowing, you know. And no one really knows what happens to these the surrogate mothers after they've given birth. They're usually very well looked after until they give birth. But afterwards, those clinics have no interest in taking care of them. We don't know how many of them develop complications, how many of them develop postnatal depression or post-traumatic stress disorder from losing the baby. You know, there, there are very few follow-up studies in terms of what happens to them. So, you know, we are mortgaging the happiness and health of a good many women in the name of giving Western couples their dream baby. We have no, we have no knowledge on what happens to those extra children. Nothing is known what happens to... No, no well, the, the first time I heard about it was literally this journalist um, going to meet, um, obviously, some kind of a gangster um, in some location in India. And she said a baby was literally handed to her. You can have the baby now. So many rubles. I can't uh, rupees. Sorry. Um, I, I can't remember what she said. Mm -hmm. uh, said the price was. Um, and that was the first time she had come across the issue. That was the first time I had ever heard of it. So, I mean, where did that baby come from? Who were its parents? I don't imagine the person selling the baby even knew. Oh my gosh. Um, you know, and now, now India has made concerted efforts to try to control the industry. Um, I will say that, that at the time I was writing the book, India was the fertility tourism capital of the world. That was where you went to get your baby and there were surrogacy um, agencies all over the West who would point people in the direction, um, same-sex couples, infertile couples. That was, that was the place they went. We had BBC documentaries and news reports, basically giving free advertising to these clinics. I remember Dr. Patel particularly often came up in the British news. Since then, um, there have been changes in the law to stop foreigners from going in um, to... Uh, as, as I think the, the ministry um, called it, to, to rent wombs. There has actually been an attempt to stop that. But of course, the difficulty is when one door closes, another one will open somewhere else. Mm -hmm. There will always be poor countries with women who are trapped in, in the poverty trap who will be prepared to do this and who are ripe for exploitation. It should be up to Western governments to stop the flow of tourists into these countries, not to expect the countries themselves to stop them from coming in. You know, in my opinion, we should we should not be encouraging and permitting that to happen. So uh, could you speak some more about that, that why is it the onus of uh, of westernized nations to really clamp down on this commodification of the birthing process and of children? of human beings? Well, I feel, I mean, I know that, for example, in some parts of the States, commercial surrogacy is legal, um, whereas it isn't, in, um, it isn't in others and it isn't in most uh, European countries. Um, but I think one has to ask the question, and I do ask this a lot in, throughout my book, is if it is not acceptable in your country, why is it acceptable in someone else's? And if you know in your heart that it, you would never accept that sort of treatment of a woman in America or that treatment of a woman in Britain, why would you accept it somewhere else? And why would you encourage it and use it? You know, I can't imagine many British couples would be comfortable with the idea of women from 
say, the, the poorest areas of Britain, going into dormitory-style hospitals, being impregnated with other people's babies, and then their babies being taken away from them without them having any say whatsoever. I think there would be a huge outcry about that. But it's a form of neocolonialism. If you wouldn't accept your own people going through that, but you're perfectly happy to exploit a woman in another country. So, yes, I do, I do think this is something that the West has got to deal with. So you, you mentioned that in your book, uh, this form of neocolonialism. And I, I hear that batted around a lot in various aspects. Uh, could, you, could you expound on uh, how this is, like, what is colonialism? What is neocolonialism? How is this, uh, you know, a, a prime example of that? Well, I tend to talk about it a lot in the book in relation to population control policies, um, where I do feel there is a direct link with old with old style colonialism that we still we still have the notion that we need to tell people in other countries what to do and how to live their lives. Um, in this particular case, I think um, it, it's it's a similar principle. I think we we have different rules in our minds when it comes to the way we expect to be treated and the way other people in other countries should be treated. And if we're making that sort of distinction, that is a form of discrimination. Um, I talk about it as well in terms of the population control policies in China. An awful lot of people in the West excuse and even support China's, China's um, population control policies. And yet the question I ask is always, well, how would you feel if you had to tell your manager every time you had your period? Would you really want to be embarrassed like that? How would you feel if you had to apply to your local council for a permit to have a baby? Mm -hmm. You know, how mm -hmm. would you like it if having a baby became an act of political defiance? Would you want to see your neighbours dragged out of their houses and forcibly aborted? Um, is that the sort of world you would be prepared to live in? If you find it shocking for that to happen in London or San Francisco or Paris, then why is it not shocking to you that that happens in Beijing? You know, I'm just I'm asking people to take a truly international view. To build off that, um, feel free to get as to get or to refrain from getting as political as you'd like. Uh, <laughs> last year, there was uh, outrage about a uh, British court ruling that a mentally handicapped woman had to have an abortion. Yeah. I forget her name. I forget the specifics. No, I, do like, remember. I remember yeah. I, the way I remember it was like on a Friday, that ruling came out. There was a huge uproar over the weekend. Monday, it was appealed and a superior court overturned it. Yeah. Thankfully, she did not yes. have to get her an abortion, but they did rule that she had to become forcibly sterilized. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, we were all extremely relieved when the initial judgment was overturned about the, the forced abortion because... Well, there is, a, there is a history, there is a eugenics history in Europe, not in Britain specifically, um, but it was very shocking to me that, that she could be forcibly sterilised because that is also part of our eugenics past. And I think, you know, as well as talking about our colonial history, we also have to look about at the way we have treated our own people in the past. Um, and certainly Britain avoided a eugenics law Mm -hmm. Thanks to G.K. Chesterton, in incidentally. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, well, what people forget when we talk about eugenics, we tend to talk about Nazi Germany because it was the, the you know, ultimate proponent of eugenics yeah. with, the, with the Action T um, projects and, and things like that. But of course, it did happen in the US. It happened um, in Sweden, in liberal Sweden, right up to the 1970s. Oh, I didn't um, know there that. Were, yeah, there were people being um, forcibly sterilized because they were deemed to be feeble-minded or to have a handicap. I mean, there was one particularly tragic case of um, a girl who was sterilized because she couldn't read the board because they didn't realize she didn't have her glasses. Um, and she was forcibly sterilized on those grounds. Um, we've had in, in um, parts of Eastern Europe, the forcible sterilization of um, Roma families, Roma women after the birth of a first child. So, you know, this is something that is as much part of our heritage as it may be part of our, our terrible future if we don't learn from the past. Britain very nearly had a eugenics law. It was supported by some very high profile people, including H.G. Um, Wells, George Bernard Shaw, 
who was a well-known eugenicist, Churchill was, given that he's now famous for fighting Nazism, um, was also in favour of eugenics. Um, and G.K. Chesterton found out about this proposed law and he had a series of public meetings around the country and he whipped up a huge amount of um, opposition and it fell sh it fell it fell down in the, the first hurdle. So we could quite easily have had a eugenics law of our own in Britain, you know, and it's something we should be aware of. Um, and so when I heard that somebody was going to be forcibly sterilised, that's the first thing I thought of was that, you know, are we are we regressing? You know, we didn't succeed in doing this in the 1930s like so many other countries did. Are we really going to fall down this road in the 21st century? And yet, in some respects, it shouldn't be a big surprise because you know, a significant minority of women who have abortions in this country admit that they are unwanted abortions. So we are already promoting coercive abortion on some level in pretty much any country where abortion is legal, if you think about it. And by that, you mean a, a, a pregnancy may be unwanted for a slew of reasons. One of them may be the financial constraints. And so if there's any reason like that, that could be seen as a form of coercion. Like, hey, you you really just can't handle this. Uh, maybe you should just get rid of it. Okay. Well, th there are a lot of ways in which coercion happens. One of them is, say, financial constraints, for example. It is, in fact, illegal in this country to have an abortion on those grounds. So. Oh. Yes, I mean, because technically, at the moment at least, in Britain, abortion is not, um, is not legal. It is decriminalised, okay. which means okay. that it is permitted in... I mean, it may seem like a, a point of semantics, but it's actually quite important. There is no right to an abortion. It's not like uh, in the US where you had Roe v. Wade. Yeah. There is no right to an abortion in Britain. There are certain circumstances where abortion is permitted, Financial reasons are not grounds for an abortion in Britain. So when you get abortion facilities claiming to feel so sad because a woman's come to them for an abortion because she can't afford the baby, what they are at least technically admitting to is performing an illegal abortion. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, if there really is a case where a woman is coming crying to an abortion facility who doesn't want to have the abortion, but she can't afford the baby... They know there are places they can they can send that woman to. I know numerous crisis pregnancy centres around the country who would help a woman like that and who do help women like that. Um, but with buffer zone legislation coming out, making it harder and harder to reach women in those situations, it's actually getting harder to to reach out to women with information about the alternatives. Um, but when it comes to coercion, it, it can sometimes be a case that someone else makes the decision, the boyfriend makes the decision, the husband makes the decision, the doctor makes the decision. Um, you know, how many cases have you heard of where, you know, a woman's boyfriend says, well, I'll leave you if you don't have it, if you don't have the abortion, you know. You don't want to have the baby, do you? You know, how many mm -hmm. girls have abortions very, when they're very young because they're frightened of their parents finding out? You know, when you stop to think in terms of what constitutes consent, um, I mean, another issue I look at in my book, because of my language, English language background, I'm very interested in the way we use language. If the literature handed out to women about abortion isn't in itself accurate, then how can we talk about consent if we're not talking about informed consent? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In real terms, what proportion of women really are fully and freely consenting to abortion? Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to bounce back to uh, and tie in the the China discussion. Mm, um, sure. So so China had a one child policy for a long time, which, as I understand, is currently no longer the case, right? Um, well, I try not to use the term one child policy because it, it's technically a misnomer. Mm -hmm. It's actually a population control policy because contrary to popular belief, there have always been certain sectors of the population who were permitted more than one child or who were permitted more than one child under certain circumstances. For example, if the first baby was a girl, they'd be permitted to try for a boy. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Partly because of the huge uh, gender imbalance 
um, because sex selective abortion is such a huge problem in, in China and it's been massively exacerbated by the population control policies. Um, so in, in some areas it was an attempt to offset that problem. Um, but there are also there have also been other rules, not being able to have a baby before a certain age, you know, having to, I think it's 23. So not being able to have a baby outside wedlock. Um, there have been all sorts of other restrictions. Um, having to space babies, you know, you might be allowed a second baby, but there have to be four years in between births and things like that. So it's actually a much more comprehensive um, birth control program than simply numbers. But we have to beware of falling for Chinese propaganda about this because, yes, there have always been exceptions made and more exceptions have been permitted in recent years. But in other cases, for example, with the Muslim minority, you may have heard that there's been a big crackdown on births among that minority. Yeah, you had. Yes. Oh, you know, you probably I don't know if you've heard of the. Um, the persecution of the Muslim minority in China, the labor camps, the, the re-education camps and all of that. Um, you know, there's there's been a, a huge clampdown the, the on... Big... So, sorry, you've frozen for a yeah. second. Sorry, I've lost you, Alex. Oh, uh, let's see if I can... Oh, no, no. In. No, no, no. You're, yeah? You're there. yeah, I can hear you. Right. Yes, you just uh, I, had just, I had just said that, that those are the weaker population. Yes? Yeah, that's right. The, okay. the weaker. Yeah. Um, and there have been reports recently that there's been a huge clampdown on births um, and you know, women being forcibly sterilized and aborted. And I find it odd that people are so surprised, though I'm glad at least it's being reported, because that has always been done to targeted members of the population in China. Because the fundamental problem is you have um, a state, you have... Um, ruling authorities who take on the right to decide whether a couple have a baby or not, who personally take control of every single woman's fertility. So, yes, if they want to be benevolent, they may permit more babies to be born. If they, you know, for, for whatever reasons they choose to tighten things up, they will tighten things up. But the fundamental problem is that the state is taking on... Um, a right it does not have you know it is a fundamental human right I, I, say, I say it's not a right to have a child it is however a right to be left alone to establish a family mm -hmm. you know so you discuss the um uh the, Ch the china policy the chinese policy of population control in your book chapter three the greatest bioethical atrocity on the globe uh and in that you introduce a term which i had never actually heard before uh gender side Mm -hmm. um, you kind of alluded to this earlier, where um, especially in uh, stereotypically in Eastern countries, cultures, there is this importance on having a male child to carry on the family name. Uh, mm -hmm. So there is in a very real sense of patriarchy there. This led to uh, excessive um, abortions of or, or just straight up infanticide of a female. Um, could you speak a little toward gender side? Yes, um, gendercide is a relatively new term. It was first coined in the 1980s, but it's it's only really come into dictionaries and is common usage in the in the 21st century. And it refers to um, an act of mass killing on grounds of gender. It can, in fact, be male or female, but it almost always involves female killing. And uh, sex selective abortion is a huge problem around the world. There are um, well, there are something like there are between 50 and 60 missing baby girls just in Asia. And whereas it is a huge problem in India and China in particular, it happens in communities all over the world, including in Britain, including in the US, in Canada, Australia. You know, it's it's a problem that every government of every country has to consider. Mm -hmm. um, and it has always happened in some way or other. You mentioned infanticide. That was commonly the way traditionally it happened. And infanticide is still a problem. Um, abortion has not taken away, you know, killing later on as well. It, it, it's, it happens at, at all different levels. Um, but with more access to abortion, more acceptability of abortion and widespread use of ultrasound, it's becoming easier and easier to 
find out the gender of the find out the sex of the baby before birth and permit an abortion. And of course, in a lot of countries, sex selective abortion is illegal, though not weirdly in Britain. We did try. Um, and um, yes, there were attempts at banning sex selective abortion in Britain and it failed. Um, <laughs> You know, fe feminist feminist abuse uh, did not accept it. Um, and but even where it is illegal, if there is any kind of corruption within the medical establishment, you know, use of bribes or whatever, um, or the police just don't do their job, it can still go on undetected. So there needs to be in countries where that happens, there needs to be a lot more protection of whistleblowers. There needs to be a lot more monitoring of what's going on because the demographics, they, they speak for themselves. You know, where there is a huge gender imbalance in a birth rate, there is no really no other explanation other than sex selective abortion. You know, it's not hard to find out. You have this astounding statistic in your book when you uh, talk about China, where you say China accounts for half of all worldwide female suicides. Yeah. That's true. Suicide has always been generally regarded as more of a male problem than a female problem. Far more men than women commit suicide, particularly young men. Um, and there's a lot more awareness now. I don't know if you've had similar campaigns in the States, but certainly in Britain about the numbers of young men who take their own lives every year. But China is the only country in the world where more women than men commit suicide mm -hmm. and accounts, as it, you just mentioned that statistic, for a huge proportion of female suicides. And suicide is the biggest cause of death for women of childbearing years in China. And you know, that ought to be considered a major public health emergency. Now, there are a lot of reasons why suicide happens lack of mental health provision, uh, mental illness still being quite taboo in Chinese society. You know, there not being very many precautions to try to prevent suicide from happening. Um, if you think about it, I'm sure this is the case in the US, it certainly is in Britain. There are a lot of things, there are a lot of protocols in place to try to prevent people committing suicide, like having, you know, nets under bridges or restricting the number of pills and packets so people can't take overdoses and things like that. But if you don't have any kind of um, preventative measures like that in place, obviously the suicide rate is going to be higher. So there are a lot of factors why it happens. But I do feel one has to consider that given how detrimental to a woman's health and well-being forced abortion or sterilization or con forced contraception is, that that has got to be a major factor we have to consider. Mm -hmm. um, so to take this to a, uh, a more international scope, kind of tie in our discussion with um, the mentally challenged woman in Britain, mm. what would you say to those who say one child policy, birth control policies, uh, or, or forced sterilization, whether or not they're on eugenic grounds, doesn't matter. That is... Uh, not an issue with abortion. That is an issue of government policy. Well, but if, if a government policy is using abortion in that way, I can't see how that wouldn't, we wouldn't still get back to a conversation on abortion. Well, maybe, I I'm, feel maybe like, I'm misunderstanding the question, sorry. Yeah, I uh, feel like uh, th this, this, uh, um, this counter Mm -hmm. to our discussion thus far is sort of treats abortion like a tool you know yeah. a hammer is a great tool to build a house it's also a great murder weapon yeah. a gun is a great way to feed your family by hunting deer you can also use it to kill people so the issue yes. Yes. yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the issue isn't abortion yeah. uh woman's choice or control over her body it is incorrect and improper government policy well ironically um I mean, you you could put forward an argument like that, but the opposition do not put forward that argument. They simply defend abortion. I mean, one of the things I found most distasteful about this whole subject is that when I first became aware of sex selective abortion and the one child policy, for want of a better word, um, I sort of assumed that all feminists would come together about this. Mm -hmm. They would accept, you know, this is whatever you think about abortion per se. None of us agree with forced abortion. That's where the common ground is. You know, we can fight this. And yet that's not what I came across. I came across defences of sex selective abortion by mm -hmm. left wing liberal journalists and feminists who 
simply are so enamoured of abortion, apparently, that they can never speak against it, even if it is a question of it being used as a tool against women. You know, and the sort of arguments, I mean, I, I quote them in my book, but I've, I've come across many since, are, you know, well, it's it's better for the woman, it's safer for the woman if she has a sex-selective abortion and that maybe her husband takes things into his own hands, which is one of the saddest um, arguments I've, I've ever come across. That's like appeasing male violence in the name of women's rights. It makes no sense to me whatsoever. Um, you know, you can't talk about choice. I mean, what one very, very passionate pro-abortion spokeswoman in this country said, oh, you know, you can't be pro-choice except when you don't like the choice. The choice she was putting forward was the choice of a family to force a woman into an abortion. Um, you know, it's if we could at least have an honest discussion about this, I would I would regard that as a very important first step. If we could at least acknowledge that there are situations in which abortion is misused, we'd have come a long way in terms of finding some common ground. You know, mm -hmm. But we're not we're not even there. You know, the, the sort of abortions become such a sort of sacred relic within within the school of feminism that it has to be defended at all costs and it, it makes no sense to me at all that when something is being used to hurt women so deliberately that we can as feminists do that mm -hmm. that we can we can defend a position like that so along those lines um I actually think it's on the jacket of the book. You say uh, you mention the persecution of women because of an absolutist position on abortion. Yeah. Could you expound on that in relation to what we've been talking about so far? Well, really, what I found um, in my my own interaction with feminism is that abortion has become almost a matter of doctrine within feminism. It has become an unassailable creed. Uh huh that everyone has got to agree with. And women who disagree with it tend to be treated like heretics who have to be sort of kicked out of the camp or forcibly converted. There's very little sense that it's actually possible for women, two women to have a difference of opinion. Um, mm. It horrifies me. I've been in feminist meetings. I've been in debates with feminists where pro-life women are simply shouted down. And frankly, it just feels a bit patriarchal to me. It feels like the way misogynists, misogynists behave towards hmm. women. You know, it, you can't say we'll give women a voice, but as long as you keep to the script, please. Mm -hmm. you know, you, you, of course you must speak and we will, we will really support you in speaking as long as you express the right opinions and we will tell you what the right opinions are. You know, and the right of a woman to speak and to think for herself means sometimes disagreeing with other women. Mm -hmm. So uh, just to, to riff off of that, um, in America, uh, abortion is primarily discussed as a subjective matter, which means that you can legitimately hold differing opinions and, hey, your opinion is your opinion, if you accept the subjective, uh, the subjective clause. Um, however, it is then rather uh, disempowering of a woman mm. to say, no, you... You, you can't say this is bad, though. You yeah. can't disagree with me. The, the, the line is yes and always yes. Yeah. Um, or the, the, the version that I've come across is the, well, no, 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 nobody likes abortion. You don't have to like abortion, but you do agree it's a woman's right to choose, don't you? Mm -hmm. um, there's, this, there's this constant trying, trying to reframe the, the whole debate. And part of what I was trying to do with my book, really, and what I think pro-life feminist groups are starting to do, I mean, it's a long process, is to try to reframe the debate. Because I think what has happened is, I think a lot of people in the pro-life movement, without realising it, have accepted the abortion debate on the terms of the opposition. Um, there's very little questioning of the idea that abortion is a woman's right. Mm -hmm. We should be questioning, you know, we, we, we tend to sort of move the, the conversation back to the sanctity of life and all of these things which are very important but we should be a little bit more confident about saying no it's not as straightforward as that mm -hmm. you know there are such a thing as com conflicting rights and in those cases the fundamental right the greater right whatever it is has got to be paramount that doesn't mean we don't think that women's rights are important but we have got to be a little bit careful about the way we we give in to the framing of the debate 
Um, to me, abortion has never been about women's rights. It's usually, it's almost always about a man, a man getting off the hook, frankly, in a, in a sexual relationship. But, you know, we have to, we have to be prepared to re-examine the, the whole use of language out there, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, JP2 in his letter, Mulieris Dignitatum, does mm-hmm. discuss that uh, quite powerfully, where he says, like, you know, wh- what do we see when we see a woman being persecuted and he, he specifically mentions like a sexual sin. Um, mm-hmm. We the, the, the other half of that crime is in the shadows, is uh, is missing from the discussion and may even have joined the persecutors. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you mentioned two things I'd like to get into here. Um, the misconception of abortion as a right. Mm. Well, I think one... Um, one thing I think we have to perhaps be a little bit more vocal about, and I think this is something pro-life feminism is good at, is good at talking about, because perhaps we, we do talk so much about the female experience, is that we agree with the right to bodily integrity. Now, there is a difference between bodily integrity and autonomy. It's, it's, not, it's not quite a point of semantics. It's quite important. But we do agree with the right to bodily integrity. And in fact, whether or not we're aware of it, the right to bodily integrity is very central to all sorts of other rights. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it has a huge influence on the way the police are allowed to behave or are supposed to behave. Um, it's, it has an impact on the way teachers behave in the classroom, the way doctors behave. You know, the fact that a doctor can't operate on a person without their, them signing a consent form, that teachers aren't allowed to bash um, children in the classroom if they misbehave. Um, the fact that, you know, People have all sorts of rights if they're arrested. You know, these are all connected up with the right to bodily integrity. The fact that we accept that people do have rights over the the perimeters of their own bodies. However, when it comes to abortion, you have a possible conflict of rights there. You have the woman and her right to bodily integrity and you have the right to life. Mm -hmm. And my opinion is and my feeling is that when there is any kind of apparent conflict, the more paramount right, the more the more fundamental right has got to come first. That doesn't mean that the right to bodily integrity does not exist, but the right to life trumps anything else in that particular point. Now, as it happens, we in fact instinctively realise that, and that is something we accept pretty, not, I wouldn't say without question, but with a lot less questioning, in all sorts of other areas of our lives. For example, we've been under lockdown for the last three and a half months in Britain, as I think you have been in parts of the States at least. Mm -hmm. Um, The overwhelming majority of people in this largely liberal secular country have accepted being under house arrest Mm -hmm. for months. They've accepted the loss of their livelihoods, the closure of their children's schools, not being able to travel without the police asking you where you think you're going. I mean, this is, you can't begin to imagine what an affront it is to most Englishmen to have a policeman tap you on the shoulder and ask you where you're going when you're going about your lawful business, you know, but we have accepted, I mean, you know, I found it's been extraordinary what's happened in the country. And yet for most of us, it has been relatively straightforward to accept because we accept the idea of the greater good and public health and the need to protect the vulnerable from illness. And, you know, even though there have been pockets of protest, the majority of people have gone along with that. And in that, if that is that, if that's the case in this situation, we are accepting that actually it isn't just about us and it isn't just about our bodies and our lives and our rights to decide. It is actually about the common good and about the care of other people, particularly the safety of the most vulnerable. Um, and that's, you know, that's probably the most extreme example anyone's had to deal with pretty much ever. This is an unprecedented situation. But in fact, we have situations like that in our lives all the time where people are prepared to hold back on their call for their own rights for the sake of others. Mm-hmm. So, I, I... Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and that touched on the second thing I wanted to talk about, which was the conflict of rights when we have... Um, one right in conflict with another. This can be framed sometimes as, well, all rights are equal. And then you can say, well, no, there is a hierarchy to rights, in which case we then have to identify what are, uh, what is that hierarchy. Uh, In America, I've always thought, you know, this is pretty easy, uh, or there's at least a very broad strokes method to this, to establish a hierarchy. It's enshrined in our constitution, the 
right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I'd argue that it's in that order as well. So, yep. hey, liberty, it's bodily autonomy. However, life comes before that mm -hmm. uh, because you can't have liberty without life. So, yes. All right. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, that's, that's exactly the, the position I'd be coming from. You know, the, the reason I see the right to life as the first right, as the paramount right, is because you can't enjoy any other right without it. All other rights become meaningless if you're not alive to enjoy them. Um, and even beyond that, one has to look as well at what it means to ask a person to cross that boundary. Mm -hmm. You know, when we talk about... Um, abortion as a right, as we were talking about earlier, whether, whether it can ever be framed that way, we do forget that a third party has to be involved with this. Mm -hmm. And one thing we have to really talk about, which we don't talk about nearly enough, is what it means to expect a person to end the right to life. Mm -hmm. what, it, what, it is, what it means to ask a doctor to insert a needle, to insert a vacu vacuum aspirator, what it's like to have to take the moral responsibility for that. And um, one thing I've really looked at is the impact psychologically that crossing that boundary has on those who are forced to do it for all sorts of reasons, doctors, executioners, even soldiers. And I've come to the conclusion that it is such a terrible barrier to cross, one that human beings are hardwired never to cross. There are very good reasons why human beings are not inclined generally to kill one another for the sake of the continuation of the, of the human race, that we have to think about what it does to a person if they are put in that position. Um, the One of the cases I've mentioned in the book, which was one of the saddest I think I've ever really come across, was the the doctor who committed suicide. Do you remember that part where he walked out into, into the stormy sea? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that, I mean, that happened long before I was born. It was one of the early, it was, it was quite soon after abortion was legalized in this country. But it did set me thinking about what it means to ask somebody to kill. Mm -hmm. Because with euthanasia, for example, we talk about the right to die. Um, we're not talking about the right to die. We're, walking, we're, we're talking about the right to be killed. That's what it really means. So we're asking somebody to kill us. But the same is true of abortion. You know, you're asking somebody to take on a responsibility like that. And we're not stopping to think about what sort of a toll that takes mentally, physically, spiritually, dare I say it, on the person responsible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, could, you, could you briefly discuss the problem of the violinist? Oh, the, <laughs> yes. Um, Shall I, uh, I suppose I want to talk a bit about where that comes from for, um, for listeners yeah. who maybe haven't heard this ludicrous. Yes. Um, I mean, it's a very common analogy that's used um, in, the, in this whole philosophical discussion. There's a, a very well-renowned violinist. And um, let me get the details right. Someone wakes up and finds himself plugged in to the violinist because... Um, he's being used as life support for the violinist. Human dialysis. He, yeah. yeah. Um, and um, so a group of music lovers have abducted this person and drugged him, and he's woken up to find himself physically attached to the violinist. And if he detaches himself, the violinist will die. Does he have a duty, therefore, to remain attached to this person? Well, what about his right? He never asked to be attached to him. And I think it's interesting as an analogy because it does open up that whole discussion about the duty to support life uh, and all the rest. But it's a very poor analogy because for a start, pregnancy is a natural process. It's not at all the same as being forcibly plugged into somebody else's cardiovascular system, um, which the human race, you know, we haven't actually been built to do. Also, it completely ignores the sense of the mother-child relationship. The violinist is a stranger. Now, I suppose I might give, say, an organ donation, a, kid a kidney to a stranger if I were I. I don't know. Thank God I've never been asked. I hope, hope I wouldn't be. I'm quite fond of having both of them. Um, but, you know, one might do that for a stranger as an altruistic, you know, uh, decision, but would certainly not be obliged, I think, 
Um, however, when it's your own child, you have a bond with that child and a set of responsibilities that is completely different. Um, and it's almost by sort of using the analogy of, sort of two strangers wired together, it completely ignores the reality of pregnancy because arguably you do have responsibilities towards your own child, which you don't have towards somebody else's child mm -hmm. or to another adult. So it's, yes, it, it's an interesting analogy on one level because we're having this discussion. Perhaps we would not be having this, this conversation if it wasn't for it, but I just, I don't really feel there is an analogy to pregnancy. I think it. It's interesting that it draws attention to that. I can't think of any other human experience that is akin to pregnancy. It is so unique as a symbiotic relationship. Um, possibly conjoined twins, but even then, that's still not a normal situation. That's an unusual sort of medical situation. So it just draws more and more attention to the uniqueness of pregnancy and the fact that we, we have got to talk about pregnancy in terms of pregnancy that there's no other way really of approaching it. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to return to uh, feminism uh, and the, the sort of, uh, you're not allowed to be a feminist if you're pro-life. Um, mm -hmm. I think in one of your talks uh, at, uh, oh, Spuck? Oh yes, yeah. At one of your talks, at, what's, the, what's Spuck stand for again? Um, Society for the Protection of Unborn Children. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so the, world, the world's oldest pro-life group, <laughs> apparently. Uh, so you, you've got uh, many videos on YouTube uh, at Spuck, and one of them, um, you talk about how you had been uh, no-platformed. Now, I had heard of deplatforming before. Someone goes to give a talk at a various location, and then there's, you know, uh, an uprising of the locality saying, we don't want this person here, get them, get rid of them. But you were just straight up no-platformed. Yeah. I've had a talk cancelled, um, and I've, I have found, I mean, I, I'm now very much a freelance writer, um, but when I was doing a lot of talks in universities, I did notice a point at which it started to become harder and harder to get into universities. And when I did manage to, there would be somebody protesting. Um, and we have created a, a culture in Britain, and I think it, it is the same in the States, of the, the no, pl no platform, um, no offence kind of culture where it's becoming harder and harder to have a conversation in a university environment mm -hmm. and I find it very sad and very concerning um, not just in terms of feminism or women's rights or anything like that but just in terms of civil liberties and the future education of our country because if you can't have a robust discussion in a university environment I'm not sure where you can um, and if we're going to create a situation where we're too sensitive and too easily offended to even consider a difference of opinion, then we're, we're moving towards despotism for, for what? For not upsetting ourselves, for making ourselves uncomfortable? You know, it seems like a very facile reason to lose the liberties we fought for. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it does worry me. I, mean, I had, you know, I've had protesters turn up. You haven't even heard my talk. They're just they're just because they've heard what my position is, you know. And you should at least be able to hear someone speak. You should at least be able to hear someone give their give their opinion because, in some ways, it's also about you learning about who you are. Um, I was reading a book recently, um, reviewing a book actually called "The Madness of Crowds." by um, a sort of slightly neoconservative conservative journalist uh, in Britain called Douglas Murray. Now, I didn't agree with everything he said, but he did talk about, he was mostly talking about this, about this no-platforming sort of thing that's, that's going on in universities, that hearing something you disagree with, it's not just about opening you to the possibility you might be wrong. It's also about getting you to question what you do believe so that you educate yourself about what you actually believe as well as what you don't believe. Because if you can't hold up your own views to scrutiny, then they can't grow. You know, you, you lose any right. It's not just about engagement with somebody else's ideas. It's also about engagement with your own ideas. Um, and if we're losing that, I mean, the intellectual stagnation 
that we can be creating. And we're seeing the knock on effect of that. It's not just no, no platforming. It's people looking over their shoulders, worried every time they make a statement in case they get a Twitter mob. I mean, mm-hmm. out to get them, you know, the, the cancel culture has followed on the heels of the no platforming culture. Mm-hmm. You know, so for me, this is a civil liberties issue. It's not even just about women's rights. I think this is this is something that's that's striking at the core of what we understand by a free society. If I could push back uh, against the um, something you've said, uh, you sort of imply this carte blanche ability. Everyone should have the right to be heard. Uh, if I want to give a speech and someone hires me to give a speech, then I should be able to go give that speech without people, you know, demanding it be changed. Okay, fine. Um, however, what about like legitimately detrimental or deleterious conversations? I'm thinking particularly in America, we had um, a, a radio show provocateur who w- kind of made the waves by saying that one of our one of our elementary school mass shootings was a Russian hoax, the Sandy Hook shootings. Um, and so this Who particular commentator, uh, his, his, he goes by the name Alex Jones. Right. Um, and so he was, I think he was the first person to get banned from Twitter just for saying something like that. Right. Uh, don't quote me on that, though. And so okay. he was like very quickly, he was deplatformed across like all social media accounts. Yeah. Um, monetization was removed for everything he puts out. Uh, and it was very much seen as like a, yeah, yeah, this guy shouldn't be, he should not be given a voice. And there are, I don't know how many people listen to him, but there are some very strong followers of this man. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so like, is there, is there any room for, uh, for retraction or like, well, no, maybe, maybe some people shouldn't be given a platform to voice their opinion to the masses. Well, I think there there have always been certain regulations in terms of when, when people do speak in public, for example, the incitement to violence, um, has, you know, has been regarded. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I know. I know it's slightly different in the states because you've got because you, the way your constitution's worded. But it's it would certainly be illegal to stand at Hyde Park Corner and start saying let's kill everybody or let's kill a certain yeah. group of people. You know, um, anything that could actually cause direct violence or harm to a to a group of people. Yes, I that does get censored, and I would not put that with the, nor- the normal bracket of censorship if you're actually trying to actively to persecute a group of people you know again the rights of that the right to life of those people has got to be stronger than the rights of someone to say i want to let, let's all kill these people you know i think that's i'd like to say that's self-evidently true but you know we have to be able to talk about you know, where the where the perimeters are however the possibility of causing offense well it's okay. in the nature of any kind of adult conversation that someone may take exception to something you're saying. And it's one thing having a right to protection from violence. It's quite another to um, have a right to protection from your feelings being hurt. You know, it, I don't think people should go around being offensive. Um, I think, you know, good manners and courtesy strike me as a very good idea. Um, maybe something I've come, come, come out of my convent education. I don't know. Um, you know, I, I don't think we should go out to offend people, and I don't think you know we should encourage that. And it's one of the things that I find most disturbing about social media. Actually, is the incredibly ugly way in which um, arguments are put across. But do you ban someone because they're a nuisance? Mm-hmm. You know, do you okay. ban someone because somebody cries because they say they don't want to hear it? You know, part of being an adult is to take the risk of being offended. You know, um, I was. Um, in a, a panel discussion, I mean, I wasn't actually on the panel, I, I um, took part from the audience um, in Oxford some years ago, Naomi Wolf was on a panel with a number of others. And one of the other panellists was putting forward the argument to have buffer zones outside abortion facilities because um, women shouldn't be upset, you know, walking into facilities and seeing banners and things. And Naomi Wolf said something along the lines of, I want to, I want to get what she said correct, I do it, well, if they're going to be upset, perhaps they have to be upset. It's, you know, she made, she made the point, and I, I, I'm not going to try and quote her directly because I'll get it wrong, but the point was being made, shall we say, that, you know, we're not children. You know, mm-hmm. it, it, sh- it shouldn't be a question of sort of getting women to cover their ears and not listen. You know, 
sometimes yeah you do just have to deal with stuff that's upsetting and that's part of being an adult and that's part of being a well-adjusted adult you know so sure I, I'm not saying that you know there aren't limited situations where a person you know may have to be denied a platform but I think they are they are very censorship to me is a it's always something I asso- I'm going to associate with tyranny and it's something I think that has to be you know only ever regarded as as something in extremis you know mm-hmm. where, where potentially lives are in danger air on the side of uh freedom air on the side of letting per- people speak when they desire to mm-hmm. i mean um, i'm not saying there shouldn't be comeback i think if somebody is saying something very offensive for example that you know there should be free discussion there should be robust discussion you know i'm personally i'm perfectly happy if i'm giving a talk for people to ask me lots of questions mm-hmm. you know um, I think we should certainly challenge bad ideas when they when they're when they're out there. We should challenge any idea, um, but don't don't gag people and prevent the debate from taking place. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think uh, the the sort of agreement with you would be that yeah yeah uh, you know like harm exactly we should prevent harm when possible. Uh, and if someone is just going to you know be rude or be a jerk. Mm. And you should be grown up enough to do this. However, uh, there is also this idea that um, psychological harm is more real than we have been uh, giving a credence. Um, so so a lot of the abortion debate in America is centered around like, hey, uh, you can be granted um, contraceptives or uh, uh, prescription pills or abortions if this would do undue psychological harm to become a mother. Um which I always found odd uh, to say that being a mom is psychologically harmful, uh, since it is the the only way that humans procreate. Um, but like, what would you have to say about this idea of like extending the concept of harm to to motherhood, mm-hmm. to being insulted, to being triggered, or something like that? Yeah. Um, I mean. I think the well, it's quite a broad subject, but I think uh, to take the first first step, I suppose, um, in Britain, the door was opened to widespread abortion through the idea of the, the mental health of the mother. Um, prior to the Abortion Act of sixty seven, which was when the, the floodgates were opened with abortion, there was much earlier a case where. Um, a 13-year-old girl was raped by sh- soldiers. That was the story, anyway, that was was given. A doctor called Alec Bourne performed an abortion on her and then gave himself up to the police. It was a deliberate test case. Gave himself up to the police and went on trial. And he argued that she would have been a mental wreck mm-hmm. if she had had the baby. And he was acquitted. And that, in fact, was what opened the door to abortion law um, change later. It, it didn't all happen in sixty seven. That that was quite an important. The Bourne case was quite an important case, and he was actually devastated later and became involved with the pro life movement because he felt that that decision had opened the floodgates to permissive abortion, which he had never intended. Mm-hmm. Um, but the the argument, the the mental health argument, tends to be used as that foot in the door, and it's. It's quite an odd argument to use because we also know that abortion can cause terrible mental health problems for women, particularly women who've been through sex abuse. It's one of the few categories of women that the abortion lobby is prepared to admit can be detrimentally affected by abortion. Um, And some time ago, I think it was the Britain's Department of Health, came out with a study that was supposed to silence the whole detrimental mental effects of abortion by saying we have found that it makes no difference mentally to a woman whether or not she has an abortion or whether she gives birth but of course the counter to that was well if that's the case then why do you cite abortion as helping a woman's mental health if it makes no difference you have just cancelled out the major criteria for abortion in britain um you know, if you know what was supposed to silence the pro-life movement ended up silence the pro-life argument ended up actually cancelling out a very very major argument made made by the abortion lobby, and 
I think the when it comes to mental health, uh, mental harm or psychological harm, we know that it's real. We know that mental illness is real. And there has been a lot more awareness, I think, in recent years, a lot more willingness to talk about mental health. Um, in this country, we've had groups like Rethink Mental Illness and, and um, groups like that trying to trying to be a bit more open. But the fact is, yes, a woman can suffer from postnatal depression. Um, I would argue that the mental health effects of abortion are much more serious because um, I've got some personal experience of postnatal depression. And when it happens, you have a baby. You have to get up in the morning. You have a reason to get better you have a reason to move on and it tends to be temporary you know it can be very very serious in the early months after a birth but it doesn't last all a person's life you know you don't tend to have women who are still suffering with postnatal depression when they're 60 with the mental health effects of abortion they can last a lifetime you know and they are so they're they're very different and i find the idea that giving birth is in itself some kind of a trauma, very strange in that sense, because as you say, it's, you know, it's a perfectly natural process. Now it is life changing. Giving birth is life changing. We should be aware of that. But then being pregnant is life changing. However, it ends, you know, Mm -hmm. by the time a woman is pregnant, she has already gone through a life changing experience. Um, I do think that for some women who are more vulnerable, who are in difficult situations, they may need much more support during a birth and afterwards in coping with motherhood, in coping with the change of life, because it is a big change of life. But the emphasis should be on support. It shouldn't be trying to get rid of get rid of the pregnancy or get rid of the problem. It should be about you know acknowledging the problem and supporting the woman in you know in actually getting you know, coming to terms with motherhood or possibly adoption, if that's the answer. If a woman really is not mentally in a, in a position to give, um, you know, to give a future to a child, we should stop talking about adoption as if it were a dirty word. You know, it can be, I, I have nothing but admiration for women who do put up babies for adoption. I think it's an incredibly courageous and very, very difficult decision to make, you know. Mm-hmm. To admit that you can't care for this yeah. child and potentially never see it again yeah and, um, and it's, it's a and it's a huge decision to make and it's not one i would, would make would talk about lightly but i think when women do that i i think you know they have my admiration not my not my consternation i think that's you know to actually admit that your child is better off with somebody else that you know as a mother i mean that's something it really you know i i really admire and it and and at the, at the same time, feel a great deal of sympathy for a woman in a situation like that. I think that that's very, very difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, um, to address it directly, uh, if I could give you uh, another another person for someone to argue against. Mm-hmm. Um, you just gave this great discussion on the, the struggles of parenthood, of motherhood. We know that birth is a physically painful process. Mm -hmm. Uh, There is high potential for mental pain afterwards. Mm -hmm. Thank you for uh, bringing your own story to that. That's uh, my wife is pregnant with our first. So that's something that's very on my mind. Like, how am I going to help her um, if this becomes a a thing for her? And then also, like, if someone needs support, it could be economically damaging. So we have physical, psychological and economic damage potential uh from from having a a birth couldn't someone use that as an argument like hey you just admitted it therefore abortion should be acceptable so that they can be spared these this threefold harm well the reason i talk about the need to support women is because i think that is the humane solution for a society i mean um i know i discussed this a lot in the early part of my book but in my opinion, a society which relies upon abortion as a kind of get out clause mm-hmm. um, to avoid really looking after its, really looking after women, really looking after its children is a society that is failing. Um, sure, you know, children cost money. They, you know, it's it's not uh, and, and it is an emotional roller coaster. But 
they're, they're separate things in a way. Um, when it comes to the economics, I think you know we have got to we've got to ensure within society that families are able to support themselves, that parents are allowed to, are able to support their children. You know, we should not have a situation in any country where you know a mother has feels that she has to get rid of the child because she can't look after it. I mean, that's that really ought to belong to the dark ages. That's that doesn't that doesn't have any place in a modern society. You know, if we've created that situation, then we need to do something about that situation. Um, when it comes to the emotional support a woman needs, we have to just be a lot more realistic about what it means to be a parent. I think one of the dangers, and this is not me, I'm quoting somebody else, but I can't remember her name, so um, I, I can't take credit for this particular quote, talks about how the in some ways the rhetoric of abortion has created the fetishization of motherhood because we, we're, we're boiling it all down to the wanted and the unwanted baby. So if you don't want the baby, you get rid of it. If you want the baby, everything's wonderful and you're supposed to be overjoyed all the time that you are a mother. But in reality, being a parent, I don't want to frighten you, my friend, since you're, you know, you've got a happy event um, in the offing. Um, but being a parent, particularly being a mother, is a huge emotional roller coaster. You know, it has its ups and its downs. It has its, its beautiful moments, its terrifying moments. I have never laughed so much as a parent. I have never cried so hard. You know, my happiest moments have been moments involving my children, happiest moments of my life, the most frightening moments, you know, um, looking at my little baby in an incubator and being told, we're very sorry, Mrs. Nash, we think it's meningitis. You know, I count as probably the darkest moment of my entire life. He, he was fine, by the way. Um, but, you know, it's, it's part of the deal when you have that bond with a child that there will be all sorts of ups and downs and, you, and unpredictably so. Um, particularly when your children are young, it's like you're on an emotional roller coaster every single day. You know, you never quite know what's coming. And yet that's part of the rich tapestry of life, you know, and it's part of what it means to be a parent and to have that incredible bond with another person, which is unlike any kind of bond, any relationship you will ever have with anybody else. You know, we, maybe we've got, we've got to stop thinking of babies in completely clinical terms like that and just try and rejoice a little more in, in the, the rich tapestry of what it is to be a parent. You were once challenged uh, by someone saying that you, you anti-abortionists are all the same. You only care for the child. Mm. And I think it's your response, I think yeah. your response was, was so, so, uh, so succinct and wonderful. You said the mother's life is worth as much as the baby's. Mm. Uh, I, and from that, I gleaned, yes, it nicely surmises or nicely uh, summarizes the pro-life position. And it, uh, it, it undermines the critique that all we care about is the child. Mm. Because it assumes this value we've placed on the life of the child. And then also includes that, places that same value, that that quote unquote overemphasized emphasis on the child and yeah. places that also equally on the mother. And I think that just underscores this need for support, um, this need for, for charitable organizations and specifically for people like me to help those charitable organizations. A charitable organization can't exist by itself. It requires people like me to provide for it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, you know, it's um, it's a very, very common argument, certainly used against anybody who speaks against abortion. And it's very, it's very profoundly held as a view. Um, I mean, when I was told that, when I said, you know, when I say pro-life, I mean all life, I mean that the life of the mother is as important as the life of the baby, there were jaws dropping. And I said, well, what did you expect me to say? You know, oh, no, I don't care about the woman, let her die. I mean, really? I've got four children, um, you know, and I have been involved in, for example, ma maternal health um, campaigns in developing countries. I had the privilege of working very closely at one point with, um, you know, we had a, a campaign called the Maisha campaign where um, we were trying to promote 
ethical um, health care for women in developing countries and raise awareness about the huge levels of maternal mortality that still exist in sub-Saharan Africa. So it, you know, it's, a, it's a common misconception, I think, but one that we, we need to fight and we need to make it clear that you know we're on the side of the woman. We should be very definitely involving ourselves with, fortunately, the many charities available um, that can help women um, because also these groups do not get government funding for the main because they are pro-life. So they need they need the popular support. There's an excellent organisation uh, based in Canada. I don't know if you've come across Marta Care International. Um, they're much no, smaller than they should be. They well, they were founded by a British um, obstetrician who's tragic tragically died um, a few weeks ago, um, who emigrated to Canada in the 1970s because of the changes in the abortion law. He couldn't get work. And he founded this um, organization to provide ethical maternal health care in developing countries. And I think Kenya, Ghana, um, all through sub-Saharan Africa, because, of course, groups like IPPF use maternal mortality as a an excuse to try to get abortion into these countries. And he was making the point that actually with good obstetric care, no woman has to die in childbirth. Um, and he dedicated his life with a lot of um, a lot of pro-life doctors to helping both mother and baby in those situations. So, you know, the these organizations are out there and they're always desperately in need of help. Mm -hmm. So somewhat tangentially related to this, um, and that you had mentioned earlier, uh, this, if you want to call it a cultured war, which is a you know, tired term. Yes, I hate um, the term cultural war. I know what you mean, though, yes. Um, specifically, a war on words, something yeah. that I have seen uh, in, uh, in the past decade, probably, specifically. Um, referring to, referring to uh, a parasite in me, products of conception, pregnancy tissue, it's a hijacker. There's yeah. an alien in me. You mm -hmm. have a medical condition. Yes. Could you speak to that a little bit? Yes. I mean, um, I mentioned earlier that you know, because I'm a writer, I'm very interested in the way we use and misuse language. And the point I make is that I, I never hear these terms used in any in any standard pre pregnancy situation. I mean, I've had, I've, I've given birth to four babies, and never once. Did any midwife or doctor or nurse or obstetrician or anyone like that ever refer to my pregnancy as anything other than a baby? Um, and they weren't being political. They were just calling it what it is. And this is perfectly straightforward. Um, none of these other expressions make any sense at all. Um, the contents of the uterus, the products of conception, I find particularly bizarre um, because... I'm, you know, I know I say this in the book, but I'll repeat it. I'll repeat it here. You know, nobody ever talks about the products of conception moving or getting an ultrasound scan of your, you know, uterine tissue or, or whatever. I mean, none of the, none of those those um, expressions really make any logical sense. But even terms like hijacker or parasite or alien, they're not exactly on the side of science. Um, a parasite is not of the same species as you. Therefore, a baby is never a parasite. I mean, that's just a, a question of definitions. Um, it's obviously not an alien. I, mean, I don't know what you imagine that you're give, about to give birth to, but it's, you know, it's very definitely a human being. Um, hijacker gives a level of consciousness to a baby that they're not capable of at all. Um, you know, it's almost absurdly so. So I think, you know, we just we've got to be honest about what we are what we are dealing with here and all of these terms or these this misnomers that get used are just ways of trying to muddy the waters and trying to distract attention from what abortion involves um, and we know we've got to be very quick to come back on them um, and to avoid using them ourselves you know because it is part of a way of just trying to avoid the obvious i've always felt that terms like uh, products of conception pregnancy mm -hmm. tissue and medical condition are in a sense correct however they they reduce a person to a material object mm -hmm. and that in that case then opens the door to the commodification of a person which we've talked about earlier when we discussed india and and surrogacy uh, the idea that this is an object that i can own an object i can do what i will with 
Mm. And then th things like Hijacker and Parasite, those attempt to draw a, a false parallel with mm. the human child. Uh, kind of like what you said about the, the violinist. Like, yeah, it, it makes, it makes a, a, an ostensible metaphorical sense, but actually is very incorrect and directly misses the point to the point mm. where it no longer works as a metaphor. So yeah. Parasite and Hijacker, like, no. How can you refer to a human in the, a, a pre-born baby, how can you refer to that as a parasite? Like, well, I just, yeah. Well, also, it, it creates, it, I think from, sort of looking at it from the point of view of pro-life feminism as well, it sort of, it sets women against their own babies and kind of gives the impression that women need to be protected from their own babies. You know, it's using a, a deliberately very aggressive term um, completely falsely. You know, women aren't so weak that, they, that the baby has become the face of the enemy. Um, I mean, tragically, with terms like, say, the products of conception, they, I, I believe anyway, originally were used in cases of miscarriage, for example, with the intention of perhaps not upsetting the woman too much. You know, they, I remember a friend of mine talking about how she was told she had retained products of conception after a miscarriage, and you know, she had to have a small procedure um, to, um, to sort of clear her out. But what her, her comment was, it was like the retained, that's my baby you're talking about, isn't it? It actually made it worse um, because with miscarriage, a woman knows she's losing her baby. So trying to term it and trying to use phrases like that actually sort of almost add insult to injury. Um, possibly unintentionally. Mm -hmm. um, related to this, uh, you, you mention also a sort of faux outrage. Uh, you, you have this great point where you say uh, abortionists like to portray the woman as this meek and, and vulnerable person by mm -hmm. saying she's found herself alone and pregnant yes, on a toilet. On a toilet, yeah. And I just... Um, and then you just go off on that. And it's like, how else does a woman find herself pregnant? And I was like, yes, exactly. How yeah. else? You have to pee on the thing. Like, come yeah. on. Yeah. I mean, I found that particularly funny. I mean, you, you do get so much inflated uh, rhetoric in the debate anyway. But uh, that was in connection with the Irish referendum. That someone was talking, these, these poor women, you know, find out, find out they're pregnant alone on a toilet. And I thought, well... Where, where else did you do the pregnancy test, my friend? You know, and of course, when I say that in a talk, of course, everyone falls about laughing because everyone knows what a pregnancy test involves. You know, um, I think we sometimes it just shows that the level to which we're we're desperate to turn women into victims that we have to make the, the act of discovering two little pink lines on a pregnancy test as some some kind of horrendous ordeal. Um, you know, it's um, and you know, it, I think it's. It's something I mean, I've, I'm very attuned to the way we use language to kind of cast women as victims. But this is where I think women have to be a lot bolder about standing up and saying, do you know something, doctor, you don't need to protect me. Thanks very much. But you are not my saviour. And I can probably cope quite nicely without you interfering. Um, you know, it's. Um, I, I was very heartened when I heard that there was a group in the States who, um, a pro-life feminist group, they wanted to take part in the Women's March. Um, and they were banned at the last minute because they were they were against abortion. So they turned up anyway yeah. with their banners and walked right to the front of the march with their banners. And it, that that's it. I just thought, oh, at a girl, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, that's that's the way it's got to be. We, you know, you just not got to to take no for an answer. You know, the suffragettes wouldn't have wouldn't have shrunk away into the background, would they? Um, yeah. you know. uh, so that was that was a rather uh, lighthearted way to discuss the culture war. However, there's also a much uh, deeper and darker, insidious nature to it as well. Um, are you familiar with Kermit Gosnell? Oh yes. Yeah. Okay. Could you yes. talk about Kermit Gosnell? Yes. I mean, I think that was one of the big scandals to hit America um, when it came out. And yet it went almost unnoticed in many quarters, I think. Um, certainly in pro-life circles, everybody knows Kermit Gosnell's name. But he was probably the biggest ma the biggest case of medical mass murder in American history. Mm -hmm. um, his Over name, a thousand, I think. Yeah. yeah. 
It was it was huge, and you know, um, and the way it was done, you know, the way he he stabbed newborn babies through the back of the neck with a, with scissors and laughed and joked. You know, it was there was something incredibly macabre about the way he operated for seventeen years. You know, he was killing babies and abusing and endangering women for seventeen years under the noses of the National Abortion Federation and the Department of Health for um, Pennsylvania. Um, so, you know, his name ought to be as infamous as Jack the Ripper. Um, you know, he, he ought to be the name any everybody knows. And yet there was this deliberate attempt at not reporting the trial when it happened, because there was this fear it would taint people's pure views of abortion. Now, in some ways, um, abortion advocates had reason to be worried, because, in fact, I reviewed um, the book that was written about uh, about the Gosnell case. And in fact, at least one of the detectives who was involved in that case changed his opinion on abortion as a result of being involved in it. Yeah, um, because he was he was faced with the full horror of abortion for the first time yeah. at its most, you know, the piles of dead bodies and, you know, the and also the the weirdness of having to uh, one of the terrible things the detectives had to do is they had to cut open the the heads of the the dead babies they found because if they had their brains intact it meant that they were killed outside the womb if they didn't it meant they were killed in abortion because of the way partial birth abortion works it, it involves the removal of the sucking out of the brain and of course when you're faced with something as macabre as that and you're realizing that so if the brain's intact it's murder if it's not intact it's not murder you know, it, the, the weird, arbitrary nature of the of the way the law works, I think, really got to some of those who were working in, in that field. So, you know, it was very shocking, but America needed to be shocked. You know, this was happening, you know, in a country where abortion is legal and it's certainly widely accepted in certain circles. And yet this man was able to do what he did. Um, and is completely unrepentant, I gather. He's still in, obviously he'll be in prison for the rest of his life. He's completely unrepentant. He sees himself as a victim and a martyr for women. Um, and it's something I really notice that when abortion um, facilities do occasionally get raided and you do get uh, someone like Gosnell on trial, I mean, that's the worst case I've come across, but they, they do happen from time to time. They will always posture as women's rights advocates. You know, they'll have killed a woman or maimed a woman and they're still posturing and they're still being given that oxygen of publicity by the abortion industry. They're not being condemned. If we really cared about women's health, you know, everyone would have heard about Kermit Gosnell. Women's groups would have been falling over each other to condemn him. And yet nobody said a word. Mm -hmm. you know, for me, that was the most damning part of that trial was the complete silence of those who had real reason to be outraged. <laughs> I remember the uh, the attempted media blackout for that case when it when it came out. Um, is it is it true that uh, he wasn't even arrested for uh, for murder no. or abort? Like they they came after him for like a like a technical problem, right? I think it was drugs related. I think he was yeah. Uh, I think it was a drugs bust because he was also signing off illegal prescriptions. He was running yeah. what they call a pill mill. Um, that quite often happens. Um, and I think Al Capone got done for tax evasion, tax evasion or something, didn't he? You know, I mean, it's it's not at all uncommon that a relatively small misdemeanor will will lead detectives to something much more serious. I mean, I think what was shocking about the Gosnell case is that he wasn't even hiding what he was doing. I mean, anyone could have walked into that that facility, and plenty of women did. And he was inspected. Um, now, the National Abortion Federation did not give their sort of stamp of approval to him. They didn't report him, you know, and they could see, you know, they could see the blood all over the floor, the malfunctioning equipment, the blocked fire exits. You know, it wasn't it wasn't as if this was some kind of back alley op operation where, you know, everybody was sworn to secrecy. You know, he could have been stopped at any point during those 17 years. Do, do you think uh, that at the very least it was the responsibility of the um, the abortion federation, the licensing federation, to report his ethical maltreatment? Mm, absolutely. Um, you know, they, they claim to be there to protect women from from backstreet butchers. Well, what were they doing there? Um, 
And it's it's not just it's not just in the states. I mean, the the sort of thing happens. I mean, that was a particularly horrific case, and I think it's one of those. It's going to be one of those cases that really stands out in memory. But in Britain, we've had situations where you know it's it's remarkably difficult for an abortion doctor to be prosecuted, um, and this has been commented on even in Parliament. Um, some mm-hmm. years ago, a, a whole chain of um, abortion facilities, Mary Stopes International. Um, facilities lost their license Uh because they found a string, I mean, a huge, huge, long catalogue of offences that they committed. But a lot of those offences, a deliberate flouting of the law, had gone on for years. Um, But there always seemed to be the sense that they, you know, maybe the authorities just weren't looking quite as closely. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it's very difficult as well for a woman to bring a, a case because, Quite often, if a woman has had a horrific experience in an abortion facility, she's not going to be in a position to go, you know, to go through the horrors of a, a trial and, and all of the rest and, and legal action. And yeah. I guess there must be powerful people who know that, you know. Yeah. I mean, look at Abby Johnson with what she went through mm-hmm. immediately getting sued when she quit her job yeah. uh, as a, a clinic director at Planned Parenthood. I actually just watched the movie two nights ago. Um, oh, is it good? Uh, I am not emotionally prepared to discuss that movie in this interview. It was that good. Wow. Okay. I mean, I know the book. I haven't watched the film yet. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so, uh, thank you for that. I've, I've always felt that, uh, the biggest failure of the pro-life movement is their, um, uh, that they, they haven't brought Kermit Gosnell to the forefront every opportunity they had because that was that was a national outrage in america and like why don't we just it's been years hey remember kermit gosnell exactly exactly kermit gosnell it should just be that simple to be like oh yeah yeah that's a good argument right there you know and but it's not it's it's brushed under the rug uh it's it's left by the wayside by pro-life advocates so um i like to transition because as we said at the beginning you're not just uh, a one issue uh, f- feminist. Uh, this this whole concept of abortion we've been talking about so far, um, we also touched on with surrogacy, the the um, commodification of people, um, and also kind of like there's this been under this undercurrent of remember life, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This pursuit of happiness um, mm-hmm. is often conflated with a pursuit of pleasure, which I think is, you know, an avoidance of suffering is this this hedonistic culture, which, you know, I think is is pretty entrenched in capitalistic communities. And that leads straight into uh, another thing you are very vocal about contraceptive culture. Mm -hmm. Could you discuss um, contraceptives and your work on contraceptives? Um, well, I'm I'm very keen on education. I generally feel that education is one of the, the biggest equalizers when it comes to, um, you know, women getting equality and just anyone being able to get on in life. And that's one of the reasons I I so much believe in natural fertility awareness uh, because I feel personally that women should be aware of what their bodies are doing, they should be aware of their fertility, and they should start learning about it when they're very young, you know, when they hit adolescence. Uh, My daughter is 12, and I've already started discussing this with her, because it's not just actually about whether or not you have a baby, it's actually about understanding the whole way in which your body works, the way your cycles work. It's about picking up health problems very early, Um, From that point of view, I cannot see why anybody has a problem with um, NFP as a concept, because it it is so much about women educating themselves, but also men being educated about their wives. You know, I think it is very important that men are completely aware of um, the way their their wives' bodies work, you know, the um, the effort involved in going through a pregnancy. They say, for example, in um, developing countries that uh, maternal death rates go down when men are present at the birth because men, are m- men become much more aware of what it actually involves to have a baby and they tend to be a lot more respectful of their wives afterwards. Uh-huh. Which, 
which is in it, it's an interesting an interesting idea that that part of the um i mean don't quote me on that just because that, there was one study and I'm, I'm always careful with 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 one study that it could be it could be skewed okay. by things but but you know but but they certainly the positive effect of men being much more aware and much more sort of involved with their wife's fertility is quite is quite significant you know when you actually realize the miracle that the female body actually is um but for me um i came at this sort of from a different angle i think to, to a lot of my certainly a lot of my catholic friends um in that it's actually about it's about knowledge and it's about freedom because i don't know what it's like in the states but certainly when i was growing up there was a lot of emphasis being placed on not taking unnecessary medication um there was a lot of concern for example about overuse of antibiotics Mm-hmm. say and you know, it was always you know my doctor was sort of quite forward thinking about that sort of thing you know if you if you had a, a fever he'd say right you know drink plenty of water keep warm rest let nature take its course you know I'll, I'll only give you medication if you actually really really need it um and it was always if there was a natural alternative he mm-hmm. would always take it and yet as soon as you know as soon as I reached childbearing age, suddenly I had doctors touting like like street vendors. Do you want a pill? Do you want condoms? No, I don't. Thank you. Um, you know, and um, for me, the biggest the, the biggest indictment on the whole contraceptive industry was going to see my Catholic doctor, and her saying, "Well, what contraception would you like?" I said, "Well, actually, I use NFP." Well, how about something reliable? <laughs> The method I use is 99.3% reliable. It makes it more reliable than that, actually. Well, how about something different? Pills, condoms. And I suddenly had this image in my mind of someone opening a big suitcase, you know, taking merchandise <laughs> out. And, so, and for me, it was it's a question of, actually, I don't have to be enthralled to doctors or the pharmaceutical industry about the way I live my life. Sure, if I get sick, you know, I'm not anti-Western medicine. I assure you, if I get ill, God forbid, I'm not, you know, I will take the chemotherapy, I will take the drugs, whatever. But when it comes to a completely natural process, um, I don't want to have to be dependent on another industry to protect me. I want to be able to, um, you know, to, to look after myself, thank you, and for my husband and I to be able to make those decisions without the interference of my doctor. Um so that was very much my motivation in terms of the whole way I approached that. But I think more broadly, um, I make a distinction when I'm giving talks in terms of couples who use contraception and the contraceptive culture, because I'm not saying that everybody who uses contraception would have an abortion if they had a, an unexpected pregnancy, for example, because I know plenty who never would, you know, yeah. and I'd, I'd like to make that absolutely clear. It's not a judgment on on individual couples. However, we have created a culture where um, sex has become a recreational activity and it has become a very selfish activity. Um, and in that sense, I think it is it is one facet of a very capitalistic, very hedonistic society that we have created, which I do think puts women in a very vulnerable position. Um, you know, we talk about, I mean, I, we don't use the term hookup culture so much over here, but I'm very familiar with it um, because I think it does get get used on campus in, in the US. So the hookup culture, am I right, that, that term? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think the, the sort of the... The idea that that is what happens and that w- that is what women should accept for themselves and that hugely se- sexualizing of women, I think, is, is actually a very retrograde step for women. You know, that we are, we're still being treated in terms of a, a, the ob- a objectification of women and on, on the pleasure we can give to men and on what we look like and how we perform. You know, we, we haven't really embraced the idea of the multifaceted faceted woman um who you know exists to be something other than somebody's plaything you know it seems to me that that's you know we're actually going backwards when it comes to the way we look at women and the way society portrays women that you know the hugely sexualized images of women that you get in the media um it's feeding a very very old stereotype of women do you think it is a direct link between um the emergence and uh, widespread acceptance of contraception toward an increase. Well, I don't know if I would say increase. Uh, let's just say toward uh, objectification of women. I think it has fueled it. Fueled um, and it. I think, okay. yeah, I think it has fueled it because I think it has, it has um, 
created a myth that sex can be no strings attached. Um, and I don't know about the male experience, but from the female experience, that is simply never the case. Um, it's only relatively recently, I mean, you were talking about sort of psychological harm earlier, and we were saying about how mental illness is being talked about more. It's only relatively recently that we have started talking about the emotional side of sexual activity, particularly as it affects women. And for example, um, one thing that has been noted is that um, for the when it comes to the female experience of sexuality, the act involves bonding, whether or not that is what the couple intend, physically and emotionally, they bond and physically and emotionally and particularly emotionally, that leaves an imprint on a woman. Mm -hmm. And with that imprint comes sexual baggage and emotional baggage. And so from a woman's point of view, it has a huge knock on effect, the more recreational sex she engages in the more partners she has the more of an impact that has on her emotionally in terms of her future ability to connect with somebody um, and to form a strong permanent relationship and but I think because it's taken so long for us to really talk about the female experience of sexuality we maybe have ignored that um that you know the, I, I, when I was at school I remember I remember somebody saying what there's no contraceptive for the heart um, that was the closest I ever heard to anybody acknowledging nice. that, nice. you know. Um, and also, I think coming from a generation where, you know, we were very much caught up in that hedonistic culture in the 90s. You know, I know it started before that, but it was so commonplace by then. You know, I've got friends now. We're all at that stage in our lives. We're all hitting middle age and the time of reckoning, I think. And I think, you know, you make your mistakes in your 20s. You sort of deal with them in your 30s where, you know, I know women who have been really harmed by the choices they made when they were much younger, which they were encouraged to make. I remember one woman saying to me, and it was one of the saddest things I'd, I think I've ever heard uh, in this in this subject. She said, well, they taught us a lot about how not to get pregnant and how not to get diseases. No one said we didn't have to do this. She said, ah. everything, everything about the way sexuality was communicated she said, as a teenager, was that this is what you do and this is what normal girls do and normal girls enjoy it. And she actually felt disenfranchised by the fact that the one thing they never said was, actually, it is fine to say get lost. So yeah. two thoughts. Um, yeah, I, I feel like that is a, a very cogent way to put, again, the disempowerment of women Mm. by just assuming that this is going to happen and saying, well, you're going to do it anyway. Mm. So you might, and if you're not like, you're going to, you're going to be pressured into it, whatever mm. uh, you're going to, you're going to want to do it, whatever, like this is going to happen. And it is assuming a lack of uh, a bodily autonomy and choice to say, no, I don't want to. Yeah. Um, however, then the second thought uh, to counter you is, I mean, yeah, like a lot of the time it is going to happen. So shouldn't we shouldn't we play toward our knowledge base that it is a fair amount of the time going to happen amongst pre-married couples? So shouldn't we give them the knowledge and education and the capability to practice it safely? Well, I think um, there's the issue of the council of despair. Okay. And any, I mean, any assertion you make like that can, can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you, go okay. into the, if you go into a conversation and say, well, that's going to happen, therefore let's, um, let's deal with it safely or whatever, you're already presupposing that things can only happen in one way. Um, and I think, you know, we maybe have to challenge that a little bit. Say, so, well, does it, how inevitable is this, in fact, with, with education and with, a, you know, um, perhaps a change, I, so I don't like the culture wars term, but maybe a change in our cultural focus. Okay. Um, but when it comes to education, I'm not against having a frank conversation with a young person. I'm very against all of this happening in the classroom. I don't like, um, because I think that sexuality is such an intimate subject and such a private subject, I just don't see how it can be taught ethically in a classroom. I know people who are involved in sort of chastity 
projects and things like that. Um, and personally, I don't, I don't think the topic works in a classroom environment. I prefer to have a private conversation with my children because I know where they're coming from. You know, I know what emotional level they're at. And, you know, hopefully there can be enough of a bond of trust that they can be frank with me in terms of the questions they ask. But that doesn't mean I don't think that young people should be educated. And that includes knowing that contraception exists, knowing what it involves. But my my biggest complaint, I think, about the way contraception is promoted is it is not promoted entirely honestly. Um, for example, we were certainly taught at school, and I noticed this in a lot of sex education programs even now, um, that they use the theoretical failure rates for contraception. Theoretical. Which, theoretical. There are two um, failure rates with contraception. There's a the theoretical yes. okay, the user yes. and the user failure rate. And the theoretical failure rates tend to give the impression that the, that contraception is a lot more reliable. Practice than ideally. Reality. Yeah. yeah. So ideally, you know, condoms being over 90 percent reliable when actually the, the user failure rates will be much lower. Yeah. And, you know, the point I'd make to my children is, well, nobody has theoretical sex and nobody gets theoretically pregnant. You know, they're completely meaningless as statistics. Yeah. All they do is to give the impression that contraception never fails. Whereas if young people were taught that actually contraception does have quite a serious failure, failure rate, um, that, you know, there are all sorts of problems associated with it, that there are other issues that contraception will not save you from, um, that, you know, they might perhaps think twice about getting into that sort of situation, you know, mm -hmm. but also would, you know, perhaps think twice about feeling they need to. Um, I mean, I think I quote this story in my book, so sorry if I'm, I can never quite remember where I've written things down. Um, a friend of mine's teacher and she said she had a very promising pupil who was constantly absent from school. Mm -hmm. And eventually she had to say to her, look, I'm really sorry, but if you don't improve your attendance, you are going to fail your exams. You're not in the classroom enough. And she said, look, I'm not playing truant. I'm sick. I've had an implant and it's making me very unwell. Oh. And she said, you know, she's quite, quite a, a strong feminist as well. And she said, you know, how did we get to the point where a young girl has to sabotage her own education and has to put up with that level of illness because her boyfriend won't, you know, she says she has to expect her to sleep with her and, you know, she feels she has to be involved yeah. in that, that sort of a relationship. None of this is necessary, you know, and it wasn't just that that young girl obviously had not been told about the possible side effects of having an implant and that she might react badly against it. But it didn't even occur to her to say, you know, I'm not putting up with this. Yeah. You know. So I think this kind of gets at um, something we were talking about with problems of policy versus the problem of the tool. Um, it's, I could easily see someone arguing, well, hey, it's not the problem of contraceptive. That's a social problem. So we can try to... Uh, we can try to empower women. However, the argument is, the argument you're presenting is that contraceptives themselves fuel the culture that misuses contraceptives. Yes, I think, I, I suppose that is the argument I'm using, but I think it does, it encourages that whole, that whole sexualization of society, encourages the sexualization of women. Um, and you know, I don't, I don't honestly see that there's a way around that. I mean, I had, I've had some very interesting conversations with members of the older generation who obviously grew up in a very different moral climate. Yeah. Talking about, for example, Humana Vitae coming out and saying that they just did not accept Humana Vitae at all because they felt that Paul VI was being scaremongering. Mm -hmm. He said in the, in the sort of world they were living in, you know, the overwhelming majority of couples did not live together till they got married um, sex outside of marriage is still very taboo. Um, and they sort of, as far as they were concerned, well, contraception was just something that married couples were going to use. And of course, it wasn't going to result in huge you know, breakdowns in marriage. You know, divorce was virtually unheard of, you know, um, and you know, promiscuity and all of these things. Because in the world in which they were living, it was impossible for them to imagine that happening. But obviously, he could see something very different, mm -hmm. that, you know, the, the, possible, the possible effects of that. Um, you know, so I think, you know, I'm, I'm not of the, you know, uh, 
I, I don't want to name the organisation because I, I, um, I'd rather not get sued. I'm, I'm definitely, like I say, I'm definitely not of the opinion that you know couples should just have as many you know, women should have as many children as humanly possible. I'm perfectly aware that there are grave reasons for a woman not to have children. Um, I myself had to you know make the decision after the fourth, fourth, fourth birth you know, not actively to try for another pregnancy because of health reasons. You know, I'm uh-huh. very, very aware that that can be, you know, a perfectly legitimate situation morally. Um, you know, I'm absolutely, you know, I know that there are, there are movements, should we say, that uh, take a different view. Um, but I do think that, you know, there is just a, a lot more of a need for education. There's a, a lot of a need just to dispel the huge number of myths that have, uh, that surround um certainly natural methods, because of course, originally, the natural methods that were invented and developed sort of over 50 years ago, 60, 70, 80 years ago, weren't terribly reliable. But guess what? Contraception 80 years ago wasn't very reliable either. Um, You know, and a lot of people still, when they think about natural fertility awareness, are still thinking about the rhythm method and, you know, and... Mm still think it's completely unreliable. And the first time I told a, um, a relative of mine that I was using NFP, there was there were hoots of laughter. And it was, yes, you know, that's a fantasy, don't you? When you've had 10 children, I, I, you know, I'll show you how to go on the pill. Um, you know, I think we, there ha- there's a need to dispel a lot of the nonsense that surrounds the whole subject as well, because there's a huge amount of misinformation out there. Well, look at, uh, uh, you know, the saint of Calcutta, Teresa, saint, uh, Mother mm. Teresa. I mean, she, these, are, these were the, the poorest of the poor, the the most ignorant of the ignorant people who had no schooling their entire life she went in there and taught them natural family planning and they drastically reduced the number of children that those women were having uh, so it's not difficult it's yeah. not difficult to practice and it's 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 anything it's teaching people about their own bodies which is i feel the the original stated goal of uh, feminism, like, hey, we need to. It, it was, it was my understanding of the history of the feminist waves was, we, no one is talking about the female anatomy. We are going to provide that information and also how you can master yourself through contraceptives and abortion, because now you are armed with knowledge. Compare that or contrast that rather with Mother Teresa. Yes, I am going to teach you about female anatomy and fe- female fertility cycles so that you can master your body in the way that it operates, as opposed to modifying it and controlling it. You are uh, you are exploring and understanding yourself, mm. which is a much more scientific and beautiful way to treat. Uh, uh, education Mm. yeah uh thank you for that so uh under underneath a lot of this discussion so far surrogacy contraception commercialization of women hedonism uh abortion there's an underlying counter that you address in your book john stuart mill who said hey a person is a master over their own body if someone uh you know wants to be a surrogate and hey, maybe it's not the best policy in place where all of the money to the the birth mother, the, the birth woman, if you will, uh, the birth mother will go to the husband or abortion. Hey, like, you know what? My body, my choice. Uh, contraceptives. If I want to take this, it's my ability to do that. Or even kind of sadly, if that if that uh, if the woman with if the girl with the implant can't stand up to her boyfriend, you know, it's it's her body. She can she can do with it what she wants. And if she wants to stand up, she can. If she doesn't, and then that's her. You know, you argue against John Stuart Mill in your book. Could you say more about that? Well, the, the major argument is we're going to have to wind up at some point. I just realized we've been talking yeah, for two I, I hours. Realize we've been for like two yeah. hours. <laughs> it's just such Sorry. an interesting conversation. It's been impossible to possible to to stop. It's a, it's, a, it's always a good sign for a, for a discussion when it goes on. But um, the the argument I make. Um, I mean, I first really came across John Stuart Mill a lot in the um, the whole euthanasia debate. In fact, he's very very widely quoted. Um, by euthanasia advocates because of this whole issue of over, over, body, is it over his body, his mind, um, his will, he is the man as master. Um, and also this, the whole idea of the, the harm principle. And um, 
the argument I make, the counter argument I make, is that what he is suggesting is a hypothetical situation that can never happen, because there is simply no situation in which a person harms himself where he will not in some way or other harm someone else. And in fact, ironically, suicide is probably the worst case when it comes to a man harming himself terminally and doing huge harm to others. Um, I can't remember what number it is, but it's something horrendous like, um, I can't remember the actual number, the number of people who are affected if a person commits suicide, but it's huge. Um, the family, the friends, the passers-by, the paramedics, the colleagues, you know, the, the, the policemen, the huge numbers of people who are damaged by one person taking his life, um, which is sort of used as the ultimate, in, in a way, it's of, a, of a person asserting mastery over his own body. And the argument I use that even the loneliest person alive, hanging himself in a lonely forest somewhere far away, is going to affect somebody because someone will eventually find him. Yeah. And if the only person who's affected by that is the person who has to cut him down, um, somebody has been damaged by that. Um, you know, we are, a, we are a human community. We don't exist in a vacuum. It's very difficult to see how you can avoid hurting others by the bad decisions you make. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so moving, moving spiritedly on, uh, what briefly, what are your thoughts on Aldous Huxley, Brave New World? Um, I think he was very prophetic on the one level, but he failed to notice the obvious when he was writing his book. And that is, you don't need super duper technology um, to create, artificially create human beings. There will always be women who are in the poverty trap who will, you know, who will be able to be exploited for the purpose. Um, hmm. In a way, commercial surrogacy is a form, is a human form, uh, form of brave new world. Thank you. Uh, in, so I'd like to move, we've, we've talked about identifying the issues. I'd like to talk about moving in the right direction. Um, chapter one, I think you, uh, you, you wrap up your discussion in chapter one uh, with this quote. It has always been the role of feminism to question the status quo, and it is only intellectually honest to continue to do so, even if the status quo was in part forged by feminism itself. Could you please expound? Um, well, you know, we are, we are a dissident movement. Um, and that has always been the case. And we have to be prepared to continue to do so. And that yeah. means, you know, we have got to keep questioning. And that means, by necessity, questioning certain aspects of feminism that have become mainstream. You know, we have to, you know, we have to be prepared to put a counter argument. Um, and we should be able to do that and be taken seriously. If feminism starts to do its job properly, it does mean actually being taken seriously, but it is always difficult to be a dissident. It's always difficult to be the lonely minority. I don't know if you saw recently um, Professor Robert George in the States with his... Not familiar. All uh, oh, right. He's, um, uh, he's a philosopher. And he was, in the context of the whole BLM uh, riots and all the rest okay. going on, he said he always asks his students, he teaches ethics, I think, he always asks his students, if you had been in the Deep South 150 years ago, would you have owned a slave? And they all 100% say, no, absolutely not. I would have been an abolitionist. Uh -huh. And he said, well, of course, that's nonsense, because only a tiny minority were abolitionists. The chances are, in that context, you would have been a slave owner, not an abolitionist. But then he puts forward his um, rules for, his test of moral courage to see whether you would in fact have been an abolitionist. Oh. And the test goes something like, would you be prepared to have half your family turn against you? Would you be prepared to be abandoned by all your friends? Would oh, you be boy. prepared to be vilified everywhere yeah. you go? Would you be prepared to lose your job, to lose your career preferment? Oh. That is what it means to be a member of a dissenting organization whether it's an abolitionist or, you know, the equivalent today. And it's, it really is a very good test because we all, when we see movements, you know, we, we all like to believe we would have been suffragists or whatever. And, but the biggest test is, of course, now it's very popular to align yourself with movements like that because they were eventually successful. 
but it's whether would you, you would actually do that now. Um, and very few people, in fact, are prepared to dissent. Very few people are prepared to be abandoned by their families and their friends to risk their livelihoods. Um, but that is what, to be a pro-life feminist, you have to be prepared to do. Um, that makes me think of, um, I think it was Aristotle, the unexamined life is a life not worth living. Mm. Uh, that's something I, I first heard when I was probably in middle school. It stuck with me my whole life. Like the ability to take an honest appraisal of your own uh, actions, thoughts, development, and then make, and then, so like that's key. Identify mm -hmm. honest critiques of your life and then to take action to yeah. correct those. Um, and so you're saying that like the, the very fact, the, the qualities inherent of being a dissenter uh, demand that you uh, face adversity. And then w when your dissenting position be mainstream, you have to also be able to uh, uh, reflect on the history of your organization. Even you can be abstracted out beyond the personal into the um, the collective. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, um, JP. Two. So we just the the previous episodes leading up to this interview, we're going over JP 2s jo uh, Pope John Paul II's Mulieris Dignitatum and Letter to Women, where he really lays out on force the concept of the dignity to, of women, which is then also touched on in his. Um, uh, man and women, he created them, the theology of the body. Um, mm -hmm. He talks a lot about this idea of the feminine genius. Could you could you talk about the feminine genius and how that should be integrated into feminism today? Well, I mean, it's a it's a rather broad term and it gets used and misused, misused quite a bit, I think, um, in you know, d depending on the, the circle in which it's being used. I think what I would understand it to mean and where I would like to see it integrated more into feminism is I would like us to rediscover as women a certain pride in being female, okay. in the uniqueness of being female. Um, so much of feminism has um, developed around the idea of defining ourselves against men and proving that we can do what men do and that we are not inhibited by being female. And I would like to see a lot more discussion on the positives of being female, mm -hmm. on the unique gifts we bring to any situation. Um, as long as we are comparing ourselves against others, we are not really developing and we are not really equal. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's always the danger. And I think that can be said of any group which has traditionally suffered any form of oppression until you stop seeing yourself the way you perceive other people to see you. Um, and in terms of what other people are able to do, you haven't really liberated yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so to, I feel like the feminine genius could be caricaturized as putting a nice bow around female stereotypes. Oh, you're more open toward human interactions and, uh, and feelings and connectivity. Um, whereas JP2 really says uh, quite forcefully that like, no, businesses, governments, it's, uh, and organizations can benefit from having women on board because of that inherent uh, more openness toward the human and prevents us from, from becoming more focused on productivity as a means toward productivity. Mm. That, you know, if we talk about if we talk about contraception, we talk about surrogacy, abortion as like these means toward my pleasure. Yeah. Well, now these are just kind of becoming means of production, not so much uh, identifying and acknowledging the human as a person. I think this is where the complementarity of the sexes comes in. OK. I talked about women not not defining themselves constantly against men, because in the end, Women and men should be able to work together. Um, the curse of the Garden of Eden, the curse of you know the fall, was men and women being pitted against one another. Um, and I do think that women bring certain attributes into a situation that maybe men don't, or that the men do differently. But I think there is always a danger. You talked about being wrapped up, wrapped up as a, a sort of female caricature, and I think one has to be a little bit careful about that. I think it is certainly true, for example, that women um, 
are known to have higher levels of emotional intelligence than men. Okay. Um, there are certain things that women seem to find easier than than men when it comes to things like empathy and human communication and, and whatever. However, sure, one has to be careful because it can very quickly become patronising or it can be unrealistic. And things like, for example, the the differences between nature and nurture are very, very complex. And we still don't know a great deal about why boys and girls tend to develop differently. You know, there, there, are, there are so many questions and we have to be careful not to be simplistic about that. I mean, it drives me crazy sometimes when I, I occasionally go to, you know, Catholic talks that are very well meaning where somebody will say you know oh do you remember that story of the little girl whose whose parents were very progressive and they gave her lorries to play with instead of dollies and she was wrapping them up and cuddling them and saying little little truck and treating them like babies because that's what girls do um and I have two boys and two girls so I have one of each under control um and one thing I have learned is that there are certain things that it is very noticeable that boys and girls do do differently from quite young. There are also an awful lot of things that are pretty undefined. Um, one of my daughters is very, very feminine and she likes plaiting her hair and she likes, you know, wearing nice clothes and whatever. The other one goes around in a football shirt um, with her hair short and, um, you know, prefers playing with her brothers and is not at all feminine. You know, she's very much a girl. In you know, um, in that you know she's you know, she she's always talking about how superior girls are to boys and all of the rest. But you know she doesn't fit in with a kind of a stereotype, um, and that's two girls in the same family having the same upbringing. So one has to be just a little bit careful about stereotyping or trying to make the the subject too simplistic. But at the same time, I think you know we do have some awareness that there are that men and women perhaps do approach subjects differently, that men and women behave differently in a crisis, for example. Um, and that's something we should be exploring more. I, say, I, don't think, I think the jury is out, in fact, on exactly how men and women behave differently. But I think it's something we should be exploring without worrying about the politics. Mm -hmm. um, so you've, uh, to, to build off of that, you've talked about um, working women before, women in education, both reception of education and instructing your own experiences throughout your own lifetime and what you see available to your daughter. Um, mm. You've also talked about, you've also talked a lot about Margaret Thatcher, uh, mm. the Iron Lady. Um, yeah. Strength was, you've got this quote, strength was absurdly associated with a woman when she was elected. And how, how dare you associate <laughs> strength with Margaret Thatcher? Um, could, you, could you give us your thoughts regarding women in the workforce? Yes. I mean, the, the reason I talk about Margaret Thatcher is I know she's a very, very divisive character in Britain even now, even, even after her death. But when I was a child, the, the first leader I was aware of was a woman, you know, and that did have a huge impact on me because it never occurred to me that a woman might not be a leader because uh -huh. I didn't even know she was, uh, certainly as a child, that she was the first woman prime minister. And I didn't know that story, in fact, about how she'd been called the Iron Lady as an insult by uh -huh. the Russians. Um, and I found that terribly funny because, of course, she's still known as the Iron Lady and she used it, you know, um, shamelessly um, and to sort of bolster her powerful image. And the, I, that was sort of the supreme example of a misogynist put down turning into um, a tone of praise, a note of praise. Um, in terms of women in the workforce, I think it's, again, a very complex subject. Um, I think certainly you know, women should not be in any way barred from the workplace. I think we need to do a lot more to cater for uh, mothers, for example, in the workplace. I don't know what the maternity laws are like in the States, but in Britain, it's taken a long time for women to get adequate maternity leave, and we're still really working on that. Um, you know, for example, it's only relatively recently that the idea of shared... Um, parental leave has come in where men and women can, can they can actually a couple can share um, maternity leave and things like that are very important because even though it is illegal to discriminate against a woman in Britain for being pregnant or for being a mother it can happen surreptitiously uh -huh. you know a 
you know, a, a, a you know, director may not employ a woman who is of childbearing bearing age and give another reason why he didn't employ her. You know, there, there are ways of getting around it. Whereas if you have shared parental leave, um, men and women are not put at an advantage or disadvantage because it applies to both. So, you know, there are, even if the woman ends up doing the, the lion's share of the leave because she's breastfeeding or whatever, um, it just means legally it, it creates a, a slightly different uh, different climate. So I think you know, we have to be careful that women are able to go out to work, that um, women don't have to prove themselves in the workplace. Um, again, it's regarded as discrimination if it's implied that a woman you know, can't work as hard because she's a mother, but it does get implied. Um, it's also the case in Britain that even though there are all sorts of laws to protect women in the workplace, very few women ever go to a tribunal if they're wrongfully sacked. Um, <laughs> And, of course, a lot of employers know that the likelihood is the woman won't go to a tribunal, so it maybe isn't always a deterrent. So, you know, there needs to be a lot more help for women who are placed in that position. You know, if a, if a woman's pregnant and she's just been fired from her job, you know, emotionally she may not be in a, or financially she may not be in a good place to fight a case. So there needs to be a lot, a lot more done to help women like that. I do, however, feel, though, that we have created a socioeconomic situation, certainly in Britain, and I'm sure this is the case in a lot of Western nations, where it is almost impossible to survive on one income. Um, and when that is the case, it's difficult to say that women are being given the freedom to go out to work if they never had the choice to take a career break. Mm -hmm. um, you mm -hmm. know, if house prices are so high that you need two incomes to pay a mortgage, you know, you are putting a huge financial burden on a couple and on a family. And that is where, I mean, it's very difficult once a, an economic situation has got to that point, it can be very difficult to change it. But, you know, we, we have to find ways to make it easier for couples to make that decision um, for one or other of them. It's usually the mother, but not always, to take that career break to be at home for the children. Because... Certainly at a preschool um, time, it is, it is generally a good thing for there to be a parent at home for a child. I mean, not always, but usually um, at least having that option is quite important. But of course, as I'm discovering, you know, my children are now all at school. There's never a good time to be away from your children. Mm -hmm. You know, once they're at school, they're still needing, you know, somebody to give them a hand with their homework when they get home. They're still needing moral support at the side of the football field. Um, you know, you never stop being a parent or become a part-time parent because your children are at school. And I think, you know, just generally businesses and industries need to be a lot more family friendly, not just woman fa friendly, family friendly, um, just to enable the flexibility necessary for women either to go to work or, or to take a career break and not to be punished later in life for having taken a career break. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Th that's everything I wanted to touch on with that question. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, a couple of wrap up questions then, very end. Um, Fiorella Nash, what other projects do you have currently? What, what things have you been consumed with for 2020? Um, well, I've mostly been um, accidentally homeschooling four children. With them. <laughs> <laughs> Coronavirus has swept aside all the great plans I had on New Year's Eve. Um, but actually, you know, it has been a great project. Uh -huh. It has been completely unexpected. And I, I don't want to speak lightly of coronavirus because it's caused a huge amount of hardship, I know, for a lot of people. But, do you know, having having this time, it's been like being on a retreat, mm -hmm. you know, just having meals with my family every day, not constantly looking at the clock to see if we have to jump in and out of the car to get to this club or that club or ice skating or football or whatever. Um, looking at my children's education, learning more about their education, having more conversations. Do you know, it's actually been a really special time. Mm -hmm. It really has. That's wonderful to hear. Uh, next question, what other issues should we know about? Um, how long have you got? Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I have an I have a stable full of hobby horses, my friend. Um, gosh, um, you know, wow. Um, I mean, all the issues we've touched upon um, and more. I think 
Do you know, one thing I would love to have there to be more conversation about is the strengthening of marriage. Okay. You know, I think we, I think we need to have, you know, I get, um, I don't do talks on marriage because I did, I, I feel like I'm, I feel like when you, when you give talks like that, you're saying, oh, look at my wonderful example. Aren't I a wonderful example of a married woman? Let me tell you how to run your marriage. Um, and yeah, I'm sort of uncomfortable about it just from a personal personal point of view. But um, one thing I get asked a lot is, you know, how can we strengthen marriage more? What should we be talking about, you know, in marriage um, preparation classes? And the one thing I think nobody ever talks about is the the environment in which married couples live. When we talk about marriage, we always talk about the couple and their relationship and their communication skills. And we don't talk about the influence that those around a married couple have. Mm -hmm. Um, I always say to people, if you want to strengthen marriage, then strengthen the marriages of those near you. Mm -hmm. You know, make sure you're a positive influence on that person's marriage. So, yes, I I would love to be able to talk more about marriage. Okay, thank you. Uh, Whom should we know about? You've mentioned several people uh, that have been good case studies so far. Whom whom else is there? Um, What, in terms of... um, big philosophers and writers or just yeah uh someone that we should read someone that we should also look at uh watch videos of or or uh case studies that could influence our understanding of uh of pro-life feminism well you mentioned abby johnson and her okay. unique experience and and the you know she set up this organization and then there were none i have to say i hate mm-hmm. the title because i don't know what it's like in the states but in britain that's an agatha christie where they all get bumped off one after another um yeah um but, yeah. but it's a great yeah. organization yeah uh, i would have given it a different title but um you know so you, you already mentioned abby johnson but if you've never come across elizabeth anscombe elizabeth anscombe okay. elizabeth anscombe big um big influence she was actually the president of my cambridge college um okay. Years ago, she, she's long dead, sadly, but she was, in my opinion, she was one of the great, um, the great minds of the 20th century. She's still a legend in Cambridge in some Catholic circles. Um, she was one of the few prominent Catholics to defend Humana Vitae when it came out. I think she got arrested outside a few abortion facilities in her life, but she was a very, very great mind, you know, and um, all her works, all her papers are still widely available. Um, mm-hmm. so- Look out for Thank her. You. Thank you. Uh, importantly, emphatically, what can we do? Find out what it is that you do best. Yeah. Everyone has a role, um, but it's different for everyone. If you're more inclined to the welfare side and counseling and that side of things, then train as a pregnancy counselor help out at a centre. If fundraising is your thing, raise money for good causes. They're always, always short of funding. Um, If you're more of an activist and more of a lobbyist, then get involved with lobbying your politicians and finding out where they stand on these issues. Um, If you're interested in the local situation, yeah, your local your local centre is the place to go. If you're interested in international development, look up Martacare. Look up Maternal Life International, you know, these really big organisations that help in developing countries. Um, And most of all, educate yourself about all the decisions you make. Before you give money to charity, you look up what they're funding. You'll have some Mm -hmm. nasty surprises, Mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, Find out what your children are learning at school. Have conversations with your children, you know. There's there's so much to be done. Um, Mm Read my book. Am I allowed to say that? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, that's the next thing. Is uh, is yeah. <laughs> let's let's. Where can we direct people to find more about you? Where can so uh, abolition of abolition of women? I actually got it digitally because I couldn't go to the oh. bookstore, so I don't have it to show people. I am sorry. Uh, I hope it's been apparent that I did read it. Um, but yes. yeah, where can people get your book? Where, what else have you written, Fiorella de Maria? Um, all right. <laughs> you you noticed my nom de plume. Then. Yes. Um, it's very confusing when I first looked you up. Yeah, I have um, uh, Fiorella de Maria is based on my my maiden name um, because I first started writing fiction. I keep my fiction and my factual worlds apart because just for me as a creator, it's easier to do that. Um, I have a website, fiorellademaria.com. Please do visit me um, and you can um, you you can contact me via LinkedIn um, from that website. 
Um, all my books are available on Amazon or from Ignatius Press. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're all, in fact, available digitally these days. All the, they're all available as e-books. Um, but if you prefer to have the real thing, you can get the paperback. You know, I know some people like to have a book. Um, if you use Audible, um, Abolition of Woman is available on Audible. You can hear my dulcet tones reading it for you. <laughs> <laughs> if that's not too frightening. Yeah. Gotcha. Thank you. And uh, and where else can people find you? You've mentioned LinkedIn and your website. Where Are you uh, present on other social medias or what? Um, if people want to contact me, you can contact me on Facebook Messenger. Okay. I usually don't add people as friends on Facebook unless I know unless I know you personally. So don't be offended if I if I get a, a <laughs> name of a complete stranger, I won't add them as a friend. But um, but I, I'm happy to contact to, to being touched by Messenger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that's that's all I have. Thank you so much for this. An hour interview turned into two and a half. I apologize for that. <laughs> uh, great. Thank you so much for meeting with us and, and giving us this wonderful conversation. I wish you the best and uh, and hope the best for your family, your, your husband and four children. Thank you so much. And all the best for your forthcoming birth. I'll be, Thank you. I'll be Thank praying you. for you. All right. God bless. And with that, uh, I think we'll sign off. Great. Lovely.